it is all done so rajendra gandotra ji you are interested in meditation uh yes uh, i uh, there is a uh, I... buddha ceo foundation uh, online meditation which is uh, uh, i have been doing for one and a half years now okay uh, morning 6 to 730 so they do conduct for corporates also <clears throat> okay and you know that uh, mr dr kartikeyan padmasri Mm-hmm. Uh, who was the CBI director? No, ex. Oh yes, he, yes, uh, yes. He, uh, he the what he call one of the uh, founder or promoter along with the others. Okay. And you know that uh, Shankar Eye Clinic, no? Dr. Yes, Ramani. Shankar Netral. Ah, yeah. he he is also. So I would uh-huh. like uh, to utilize your help in uh, taking that to some of the corporates. Definitely. As well as uh, suppose our uh, this group also will have one program. This is uh, for uh, seven days, or eleven days, twenty-one days, forty days. After that, people can on their own with the uh, recorded uh, meditation they can do. Because when you talked about duality and uh, wave as well as all that, I could immediately make out you know that yeah. fully. Definitely, definitely, yeah. definitely. So that is what uh, one is physical fitness followed by intellectual fitness followed by emotional fitness followed Absolutely. by uh, spiritual fitness and mm. along with that service fitness we have to do service so Absolutely. this they do a program of 6 weeks right right, right. so very nice very simple right. simple it is called anna pana sati Okay. Just uh, Anna, Anna, Anna Pana meditation first, and then Vipassana. Yeah, it is a very. It is a instead of all Upasana, only one part of that. Okay. Anna Pana. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Anyhow, we will continue today's uh, discussion. One of the days, uh, I would like to have a discussion with you. Yeah. Sure. Looking forward. Yes. yes. Yeah. So yeah. Um, so Himanji, you want to start? Himanji. okay so maybe i i can go with it a uh, very warm welcome to all the participants myself aditya agarwal a uh, think tank multidisciplinary global platform chapter leader welcomes you all to think tank global conclave for india growth story and meet the expert series covering all detailed ibc think tank financial reporting think tanks rare art think tanks uh, faf think tanks valuation think tanks ipo think tanks capital market think tanks as a major part of think tanks vivek patra vivek in sanskrit means knowledge and wisdom patra is innovative news updates can this vivek patra contains slides on sharing latest developments and real life examples <coughs> excuse me by ceos cxos and cfos specialists and professionals with global experience yes. today we have think tank disciplinary global platform special meetings for all the stakeholders in finance corporate affairs industry and finance think tank has been in existence since ever decades idea was first thought in on 6 january 1991 to have a conference conclave with ceos cxos cfos panelists specialist sharing experience and real life examples our panelists are finance leaders working in reputed companies or professions since many years and have deep domain knowledge think tank platform now on digital media has got overwhelming response globally on digital mediums and expanding rapidly through linkedin facebooks etc our participants are experts have re- rich experience in industry and professions who have done chartered accountant c chartered accountant in england will cpa cfa cfp iim ca cmas isas these are frm ifrs btech masters phds they are just sharing knowledge and experience wisdoms and spreading as reach out initiative globally due to overwhelming response to our annual report corporate strategies esgs we have announced 6 p awards profit people planet professional powerful influencers and platform for corporate annual reports analyst 
professional achievers, CEOs, CXOs, CFOs, with a very respected jury, with rich experience in interactions with stakeholders and board. These recognitions and awards will be announced with a rigorous profess of scrutiny and choice and interactions with the participants and would be given digitally and if possible in a well-located auditorium in Mumbai. As participants are aware, recently we have launched long-awaited reference appropriately titled Think Tank Vivek Vatra in the Goat Story, a comprehensive conference material compilation over 600 pages sharing experiences by CSO, CEOs, CFO specialists with latest developments and series on blocking, regulatory fraud, uh, financial reporting, Indian accounting standard, IBCs, taxations, digitals, etc. We will also be covering important latest development, health is well, cybersecurity, blockchain, MSME, etc. We request all of you to subscribe to Think Tank channel. Uh, we also welcome members and panels here and the team, uh, digital global team. Uh, today we have an excellent I, I think tank multidisciplinary platform, eminent stalwarts and specialist and latest development. Uh, let's have an interactive session. Thank you. Shall I go ahead? Yeah, yeah, Rajendra, sir. You... Good morning. Good morning all, Good, welcome all the participants. Good, uh, welcome Rajendra ji. So, uh, just in, in the beginning, uh, we have Ganesh Manna and then uh, I will be playing this. Navratri, happy Navratri to all, happy Durga Puja and, uh, and CA Sanjeev Bora and in the profession. And uh, let's start the program before starting Ganesh Manna. Vatratunda Mahakaya Surya Kuti Samaprabha Nirvignam Kuru Vede Sarvatari Susarvada and now, I hope it is audible. I get started. I have tried to sing this uh, Garba.
so that's it uh, uh, welcome all uh, jai mata di and we'll have a and since rajendra ji i think you have been earlier also to our programs and still uh, then you can also self introduction also you can give and you are welcome uh, and we all are eager to hear uh, to listen to your yeah knowledge share thank you thank, thank you. you very much uh, sanjeev ji thank you everyone let's get started yes, uh, yes i'll introduce myself first but let me just first put the ppt now this is a topic but it's you might say it's a very strange topic valuation that go from financial statements but it's while focus is this this is going to be very broad based meant for all the stakeholders that is the acquirers whether it's companies act or ibc for the investors and even for the creditors and one would one would wonder there is a question of valuation when it comes to creditors so today it's going to be interesting so we're going to look at these cash flow formulas and see you know how it is important right uh my background i had done my engineering from nagpur's uh, regional engineering college it's called uh, vishveshwarya national institute of technology now way back in 1978 my first job was with hindustan aeronautics limited i moved to banking in 1983 august when i moved to idbi i continued there for 20 and a half years then i moved to private sector i was in private sector for about 9 years then for 4 years i was md and ceo of sidvis asset reconstruction company and after that extended tenure was over in march 2017 i became insolvency professional so along the way i did you know things like caib which narendra ji knows we used to do for our increments i did this indian cfa and i also did my phd my phd was about risk shifting in project financing right so that's my background and uh, i've been also into a lot of teaching i taught in iim indore from 2005 to 2010 then i am continuing to teach in iim trichy i am nagpur and i am sambalpur i handled were mergers and acquisitions this is the quick background and uh, i have seen that we face valuation day in and day out without realizing it right and when i read this book by krishna palepu and uh, healy ian healy uh, the harvard professors i felt that this is something which every stakeholder must go through so this was the you know uh, inspiration for me to say yes to manoj ji on this difficult topic where there is enormous amount of literature available uh, the doyan of valuation that is aswad damodaran's book itself is around 1500 pages so you know you can't do justice but here i am going to come up with some practical aspects how to go about right so let's get started this is of course the uh, usual uh, standard in intro introduction of course think tanks dot co dot in this is of course the disclaimer and here of course i am just giving a clarification what i am saying is that valuation is done implicitly by the creditors i am saying uh, why implicitly i am going to make it clear explicitly by investment bankers for mna and it's done explicitly by bidders for acquisition under ibc it's done explicitly or implicitly by investors when you want to invest in stocks this book i introduced sorry paul healy not ian healy this is the book which was uh, which inspired me and the objective is very clear the determinants of valuations are valuation are embedded in the financial statements so we are going to keep uh, this in mind and we are going to appreciate this and probably adopt a certain way of doing things going forward and second the challenges underlying the implicit valuations adopted by the banks and the need for robust peer comparison right so let's go ahead and let it be very uh, uh, interactive uh i must say that after in the end i am going to open an excel to see some subtle differences 
of the formulas. So we are definitely going to discuss the cash flow formulas and the issues around those, right? Now, these are my introductory statements. Most of the valuations in m &A, about 50% or even more fail. And this is not a loose statement. It is based on global research, right? And most buyers, why do these happen? Because most buyers routinely overvalue synergies from acquisitions. Only a small degree of error negates the expectations. That's very clearly understood. One can always figure it out. Right? Uh, which is, and, and especially the merger of equals, MOEs, they fail far beyond 50% worldwide. Do you remember the big merger of acquisitions, um, uh, merger of equals, MOEs, which has failed in the recent times in India? I'm sure every one of us knows it. We will keep it in mind as we go along. We will see what how things could have been done differently. Acquirers face acute lack of information. Even seasoned buyers rarely capture data properly. This was a fact. Again, born, all these points which I have given are based on the researchers. I can always share the research papers, but since there are copyright right issues, I cannot email them. Investment bankers, the advisors, etc., are seldom involved in bottom-up, detailed bottom-up estimation of synergies. In fact, what happens? Merger, you know, the, uh, the deal making is very glamorous, and the due diligence is a pure, you know, hard work. In Hindi, you can use the word masduri. So the moment the deal is being done, that's announced, the team gets into an execution mode rather than due diligence mode. It's a given thing that it has to be done. So the biases set a certain which somehow cloud the due diligence aspects. And study of 160 mergers in range of geographic and industries has shown six practical measures to enhance the chance of achieving synergies. I'm not going to discuss that, but top line synergies are often inflated and the transaction team should also look at this synergies. Point is, why am I saying this? How does it concern a lender? Because lender, especially, you know, when the lender is doing a new project, is he or she is actually valuing the project. The word valuation is never mentioned, but the project is indeed value. And we will pick it up from the formulas that we use very often and sometimes a bit, bit defectively, right? I'm, there are certain things which I'm going to move very fast on because they are necessary for a flow here. But given the background of the group here, I would be moving fast on them, right? There are some formulas as well. Now, when you talk of valuation, you know, it's an estimation of asset value. It's based on comparison with closely similar assets. And the in intrinsic values derived from the complete understanding of the cash flows and characteristics. These are the facts of life. Now, if you look at it in a summary, you know, in one sentence, you would say that the valuation is the price that the buyer is willing to pay. And the buyer is willing to pay for the valuation for, a, for, a, for, a, for, a, for an asset if he feels that there is something on the table for it. And that's where the estimate comes and that's where it becomes a, an art and science as well. Valuation is important since market price of the security can diverge from the intrinsic value that is efficient market theory. It is efficient market theory is, of course, well proven, but uh, the investment bankers have their own proprietary models to value whereby, you know, they can derive values, you know, ahead of others. Going concern assumptions, 
and of course the liquidation value is the company's value if it's dissolved and the assets are sold will not go into the details whether those are lump sum sales or piecemeal sales and of course the fair value is the price at which an asset or liability would be sold where buyer sellers are under no compulsion and both are informed about material price i am not getting into the regulation part of it the icai's uh, regulations i am not also going into the end as incidentally that's not my subject as well i am looking at the practice that is done and where we tend to go wrong and how we are going to correct right now when we are doing valuation are we really do, looking at all these factors let's recall understanding the business forecasting the company performance selecting the appropriate valuation model there are various valuation models which we are going to see that a company may be new or existing then converting the forecast into valuation this means that the certain parameters will come in and how we are going to figure them out and applying eventually eventually the analytical results in the form of recommendations and conclude conclusions the point last point in italics is how important is peer comparison for valuation this is very very beautifully brought in by the book and therefore this is a theme for today now i'm i'm just going to do one thing i'm going to mute all because there is some disturbance coming and if necessary anybody is raising a point can unmute himself or herself that's it okay so in short valuation characteristics measure of benefits expected it to be derived from the asset that's the thing which is done which involves a huge amount of exercise by the acquirer or an investor applies to an enterprise project or an individual asset an individual asset has again a range of components whether it's an equity share or it's a bond or it's a equipment or its you know division enterprise value serves for the organic organic growth a project value aids the internal growth of course enterprise value for inorganic growth if you want to acquire you're going to really look at the enterprise value so for you the acquisition price would be simply the enterprise value minus of course the debt component and minus the cash available of course after you have factored in the synergies individual asset value aids the normal capital expenditure and host of other you know activities like investing in shares this again is crucial looking to the fact that we have quintessential bankers like narendra ji and others here valuation aid not just the stakeholders but the lending banks as well and there is a need for the banks to you know use it explicitly rather than implicitly i'll make it clear as we go along right now we i am not going to you know capture all the models which most of you must be aware of and it's not even possible but i am going to touch upon something discounted cash flow models these are based on the present value framework has different offshoots present value of the free cash flow to firm is enterprise value present value of the free cash flow to equity there is and there is a spelling error let me just come correct it it should be e obviously right so this is how it is so present value of the fcc e is equity value then you have the dividend discount models for the equity value then there are proprietary models like cash flow return on investment model where value creation analysis leverage buyout buyout models by investment banks i do not have those models but probably if you do some research you would be getting those i have just pointed out for you know you to have something for a further um, search because this ppt is going to be anyway shared valuation based on comparable firms right these are broadly the things 
and let's browse through the equity valuation models before we return to the enterprise valuation. Just throw something very important. Right. When you look at the dividend discount model, you're very clear. The price today is the dividend expected plus, of course, the expected price divided by one plus the cost of the equity. This is for the buyer and again for the seller. We'll not delve into this. There is no need to have you know, any example of this. You're aware of it. The dividend yield, capital gains, and total returns, if you look at, this is the cost of equity. It's again derived from this particular formula. So the total return is this minus one, of course. So this comprises dividend yield and the capital gain. We are all aware of it. Again, I'm getting some disturbance. Let me just... Uh, mute all. Okay. And if there is a multi-year investor, this is how it is, but I'm just focusing it and knocking it off. I just want to look you to look at this. This is the value of the you know, equity based on the dividend discount model or this figure. Does it remind you that even as creditor, you have adopted this in a certain way or others? What you have done is you have calculated the value of the project company based on the cash flows year on year up to the growth phase here. And thereafter, in steady state phase, you have used Gordon's formula and picked up this value. And this is nothing but your weighted average cost of capital. You have done it. You have always done it. But you have never, you know, said that you are valuing that project company. That's why I say you, the creditors do implicitly. The difference between implicit and explicitly is that if you're going to do explicitly, you are going to be far more careful in doing these estimates and you are not going to miss out on the peer comparisons. More on it later. Let's go further. So this is essentially the same thing. Now, this is another total payout model, right? This is value of the firms, all of the firms equity rather than the single share. Here, the, the, the total payout that the firm makes to shareholders are discounted. Now, you know, whether it's dividend discount model or total payout model, you have to have a very clear, you know, estimate of the dividends. And somehow, barring some of the companies in this country, there seems to be evidence that they don't have a clear dividend policy. Plus, in our country, sometimes it is not possible for every com for a company to give a, a, a dividend, reach, maintain, maintain a dividend level or an increasing dividend level consistently because we can pay dividend only out of the distributable profits. Whereas in the US, it can be paid even from the borrowers, right? That's why you have, you know, uh, uh, leverage capitalization kind of structures existing. You would have seen recently, I think it was uh, Britannia Industries which issued uh, dividends in the form of uh, uh, debentures. Uh, NTPC had done earlier also. But what I'm trying to say is that these models have to depend on a long history of dividend payments and the type of industry, right? Now you look, look at, let's say, the enterprise value. I'm back to enterprise value. What is enterprise value? Free cash flow to firm from the years one to T, that is the time, the T year when the growth period is over. And thereafter, the steady state period starts. Of course, here T is, of course, infinity for a perpetual model. 
of course this infinity will be replaced by let's say 15 years if it's a 15 year concession period but here the assumption is that these are perpetual entities like hotels uh, uh, your hospitals etc 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 manufacturing company so this is of course up to the growth phase value one to t year thereafter it comes terminal value which is the present value based on the gordon's formula and this is of course you have uh, wscc right raised to t and if you look at public traded publicly traded entity the enterprise value is the market value of the equity plus the debt minus the cash available right and when you look at the equity value there is another way it's the maximum of b minus d whereas v is the enterprise value d is the debt or zero obviously you know if this is negative it means that the enterprise value is less than the debt so obviously the equity value will be zero but this applies in the liquidation in, in the uh, you can say bankruptcy cases not all but some right in that case there is a haircut by the lenders right and here if you see here the dcf model for enterprise value this of course will be here of course it will be instead of fccf it will be fcce that's the difference there, which will be there right now when you are looking at the free cash flows what is the formula and what are we actually doing and actually what we are doing i'll come later we are talking of ebit plus 1 minus the marginal tax rate plus the depreciation which is added back being non cash item there there may be other non cash items am amortization or deferred taxes etc or deferred revenue expenditures minus the capex which happens year on year and minus the increase in net working capital and if you call net investment as capex minus depreciation it becomes a bit into 1 minus t minus net uh, investment minus increase in net working capital right now for your fcce free cash flow to equity you essentially do a uh, deduction of the debt servicing from the fccf now the question is for calculating the equity value what approach will you adopt will you first calculate it calculate the enterprise value and deduct the debt from that or you will calculate free cash flow to equity and discount it pay with the uh, cost of the equity which figure will be appropriate which will be which will overstate the value and which is understate the value in fact i am going to throw it for discussion when i open the excel and i would like to have your comments on that right now who use these valuation models we in the introductory remarks i did mention acquires investment banks for the mergers and acquisitions we've seen how many failures happen here i gave you just the broad figure i didn't i have quoted one study of course which you can google and hopefully you know download from the sci hub sci fi hub or sci hub uh, um, uh, you know website in equity investors for the stocks acquirers and the banks for project financing i would even say that banks do it even for corporate financing very very implicitly right then what are the differences in approaches right we are going to look at it now what are the challenges and how do we meet them estimation of fccf the cash flow to firm which means you are making the projections so you are projections of the revenues the operating costs the operating cash flows the change in the working capital levels the normal capex that you are making and correspondingly the free free cash flow to firms that's what is the challenge you face 
Now, if you do a standalone uh, estimate when it's a project, do you look at the existing projects, how they are operating? Do you look at the uh, comparison of certain very critical earning ratios? That's a question. And that will be very clearly brought out in this you know, book. I have captured certain portions from this book and reproduced here. I'm going to also open a particular page of that book. Estimation of the weighted average cost of capital, it is by far the most difficult part. There is a maverick called Pablo Fernandez. He totally rejects WSCC. He says, while the cost of the debt is really the cost, but when you are using capital asset pricing model, it is a market you know, price, market cost which emerges from the market. But as far as equity is concerned, that is really not a cost because you are not under a pressure to service that. Of course, I do not agree with that. The point is you are expect taking here the uh, equity cost as a value that the investor is ready to derive from that. On that basis, is funding it. So to that extent, treating the you know, uh, expected return of the equity investors as a cost is in order. But the trouble is, how will you decide that, right? You say that, okay, I'll, I'll take the debt cost as uh, the cost, the interest rate. Well, that is slightly inaccurate because it's not reflecting the market price, but still it's a good promise. How about equity? If a private equity fellow wants 25% return, straightforward, what will you say to him? Well, that's a, that's a venture capital formula that he wants a certain return and there is a negotiation and you arrive at a certain return that you'd like to allow him and accordingly allow him a stake in the company for the money that he's invested. But when you are making so many investments, you are, whether you are acquiring the project or you are even funding as a creditor, you have to have a way of finding out the uh, equity cost. Yes, granted that it is simply the, you know, the return that the investor wants. But how do you know that the investor's return that he is seeking is consistent with the market? Fortunately, we have a brilliant model, which is a one-factor model, capital asset pricing model, which uses beta, which is simply the ratio of the covariance between the stocks beta and the uh, beat, uh, stocks stock and covariance of the variance of the stocks return and the market return, market portfolio return, divided by the uh, variance of the market portfolio return. Granted that market portfolio is a bit theoretical, but there are good promises available. The question is, does the capital asset pricing model through the scrutiny of validation, statistical validation, the answer is fairly good there. Then there are other models which are very complicated, but this is a brilliant model. It does help us. Ian Healy, the, sorry, the Stalepu and uh, Ely's book brings out a very interesting statistic on this, which I'm going to share, which I'm sure you are going to find very useful. But having fixed the value of equity today, how do you make sure that it's going to remain the same there? Second point with WSCC is, is the debt equity ratio going to remain the same? Does the company rebalance its you know, debt and equity to keep it at the same level? No. That doesn't happen. So how do you use WSEC, which has been very carefully determined all the time based on the estimate that's there today? So good thing is that while you may have some inaccuracies by estimating the equity value today, you may also you know, tone it down going forward. And based on the changing leverages year on year, you can take the WSEC changing every year in this formula. Why do you need to keep the WCC as one figure? Year on year, let it change. You're not doing manually. You're doing with Excel. You're doing with a spreadsheet, so there is absolutely no problem. 
Why I, I spent a few minutes on that? Because I wanted that you keep it in mind and you do adopt it. Now, this is something which is done perfunctorily. Let's say when the idea, very good idea, Sergei, the idea and Vodafone merger happens. Everyone knows that they have very strong organization and management. Both have decades of, you know, history, right? So you do it. But the trouble here is, this causes a bias with every stakeholder there, from the, from the investment banker who is aiding in valuation to the company team which is doing valuation to the uh, seller also. Of course, the seller is very happy to have a bias in his favor. So this is often missed out. And once this is missed out, the due diligence suffers. And this becomes very, very significant when you are doing a project finance valuation. Let's not you know, forget that in project finance also there is a valuation. Let's make it now explicit rather than implicit. I'm going to come to that again later. Capturing the business model, how to do it? The business model, even if you pick up, let's say, a, you know, edible oil and some hair oil business. Let's pick up Marico, which is the number one. And let's pick up somebody who came up from, uh, uh, from the bankruptcy, Raj Oil. They have totally different models. But how can you pick, pick up that, you know, uh, different models. How can you analyze those? It's easier said than done. And for you know, capturing the real practice, you need to have uh, uh, an example. That's what the book presents. Analyzing financial statements. Now, this is also done very perfunctorily. The figures are picked up, but they are not adjusted for the various you know policies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Last but not the least, beating the biases. So this is how it is. Now, here I am now coming to this very book. This is based on the fact that the companies have a history of past performance that is recorded in their financial statements, whereas the uh, proposed uh, projects do not have, right? And how can the valuation be estimated from financial statements? That's the question. Now, you can estimate these financial statements provided you blend certain things here. Business strategy analysis, the accounting analysis, the financial analysis, and the prospective analysis. And do you realize here, this means that this is a multifunctional job. Not one man can do it. Not one professional can do it. It is finance, uh, accounts, business, and in that also strategy, and the domain expertise in that particular industry. So what does the accounting analysis do? Examines accounting rules and conventions representing the firm business economics and strategy in financial statements if necessary, by adjusting accounting measures of performance. Now, you would have seen that there are some companies which give, you know, the inter-division breakup. Of course, the, uh, nowadays, oh, from companies at 2013 onwards, the financial statements, formats, and the tarot have, you know, seen a sea change. Things are improving very fast. So my point here is that this analysis is still very necessary and it will be it will continue to be very necessary until we reach a stage where the financial statements can be taken at face value today they are not taken at face value the acquirer has to do his due diligence even in insolvency and bankruptcy code it is very risky for the acquirer you know the bidder or resolution applicant that's the phrase which is used to submit a bid without looking at the transaction or forensic audit. What I do is when I 
I am handling is a a, uh, a project, a, a company, a corporate debtor. I without even asking, I put the transaction audit report in the um, virtual data room, and he is under obligation to me keep confidentiality. But let him get the you know all the in, inside information. And the due diligence gets gets facilitated if the information is coming from the insider. So RP becomes an insider. Anyway, I'll not go more into that because this is not a session on the IBC acquisitions. Financial analysis, financial ratios and cash flow measures relative to either peers and the historical performance, and or both has to be done. Now you know this becomes very important. If you have seen power project financing, they from 1996, I think 1996 was the first IPP funded. That was uh, uh, GVK Power, and another was Spectrum Power. Until recent years, then of course the pro power project financing has not been done. Peer comparisons were done only for the project cost, and that took perfunctorily just to justify any project cost. There was no zero-based analysis. You may do a peer comparison, yet adopt a zero-based analysis. No such thing was done. Nobody ever paused to see what were the projections of those peers and what were the actuals. So peer comparison vis-a-vis -vis the past performance if the firm is you know, operating. Prospective analysis, this requires blending of all and coming up with financial projections for valuation and linking the valuation with the other numbers, DCF and book value multiples, etc. Granted that different value will give different figures, sorry, different models will throw different figures, but those different figures of valuations cannot be radically different. In one case where I am a, I am a CIRP advisor, I found that the valuer said that uh, since the operating cash flow becomes negative. This cannot be valued. And therefore, only the liquidation value will apply. And the liquidation value was coming to very substantive figures. Okay. Granted that if the... So, uh, Rajendra ji, one question. Yes, yes please. Yes, please, Narendra ji. Yeah. In my experience yes. uh, in the banking field, with our due respect for valuers and all, uh, it so happened uh, the valuation which has been done at the time of sanction didn't come to us any help in terms of at the time of recovery. And uh, whenever any question is asked, uh, that uh, usual reply, sir, that is that time and we hear that. So similarly, uh, in all your uh, merger, acquisition, all that, whatever, overall, I would like to know how independent uh, valuers are and how they are uh, true to their cause and the profession and whether, uh, of course, we have an instruction that whenever you have above 50 lakhs, you took, take two valuers and then maybe average it, all that is there. But uh, even in various, uh, I saw that while, and it so happened that uh, the valuation vis a -vis at the time of recovery is so, so huge difference. Uh, whatever may be, it may be plant and machinery, it may be a real estate building and all, or whatever, real estate, all that. No so much comparison. And in the industry or the market, it is not. It is reverse. In a way that, no, ideally the price would have gone up. But it is not so. How are we making best use? So you are also a banker. Has that really you got uh, uh, full feel that all this methodology, all that I understand, but overall, whether it has been any useful to us? Uh, Narendra ji, thank you for this very, very crucial question. Now, I am just about to finish one article. In that, I have put one, you know, one figure. Allow me to stop this share and sh share that particular you know, figure and then answer your question. I'll come back to the, this PPT later. Uh, this is a good digression. Thank you very much. Give me half half minute. So Give we'll me. have a later uh, answer. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Since this is a very crucial point, I'll just cover this. Absolutely yes. no problem. This is, in fact, 
seamlessly happening. There is absolutely no problem on this. Correct. I'm just opening it. It's very yeah. seamless. It's very, very crucial. And, and, and this is one uh, article I'm writing. I have already written 2,904 words, of course. Uh, some more is to be done. I have you know, shaded something so that the publisher may like, like to keep it or remove it. So this is what it is. Now, you, this is going to be very interesting. You're going to see this. Okay. So you have a lot of data with you. I have a lot of data. Article. I have a lot of data. I have proprietary data. And I must <laughs> thank people like you who share with me the documents. This is, <laughs> I have relations in the lending world. It's, you know, some of those juniors are still there, but in the next year or so, I know I will have nobody, no contact there. This is please have a look at this. Yeah. This is what happens in the real world. And let me tell you, Narendra Ji and everyone. When I was general manager of project appraisal department in IDBI in Mumbai, uh, and I left from there, went to um, uh, Hyderabad in May 2002. So from, uh, from about September 96 to May 2002, when I was there, right, I was handling infrastructure project financing. And, you know, one of the... Uh, I'll not name that company, the engineering company. Uh, director used to come to me seeking business by way of lenders engineer. Okay. When I left IDBA and I, and I joined a big corporate uh, in the top management, at that time I was raising funds for a 155 megawatt power project. Right. The same fellow was again coming to me. Right. Now, let me confess. Okay. I was raising a debt for the project, which was more than the project cost. And I was do doing knowingly and I was very uncomfortable about it. Right? What I had suspected in the lending side, I was doing it, but I was doing, let me use the word uh, Sanskrit phrase, with Sakshi Bhav, you know. You know, I was just doing my duty because that was the call of the day duty. <laughs> right? Now, now, this group had an excellent project management and operation and maintenance capabilities. It was acquiring secondhand uh, gas turbines from Japan. Okay. Now this, their ability to refurbish is what beyond any doubt. Now the same fellow who was sitting outside my cabin in IDBA was coming here also seeking business. And incidentally, incidentally, the same fellow, the same you know, collaboration with a West German uh, engineering firm situated in Delhi was engaged as lenders engineer by IDFC, which was funding this project. Mm -hmm. So what do I do? I have to create a bias. So I gave him a more lucrative job in another group company. And my job was smooth. Now, let me clarify. Sir. I did it because I did not want hiccup in a project which was otherwise good. On what basis am I saying I have the advantage of hindsight also? The open cycle capacity as against 100 megawatt, it delivered 106 megawatts. So it was okay. proven. <clears throat> open cycle was based on gas turbine. So the project was perfect. But I do it. The corporate does it for taking all the equity out and more. I can tell you that also from my first hand experience in the corporate. So what happens? This curve. This curve, this big one, this, this big color, the thick curve, this shows the cost overstatement per unit capacity. I'm not using the word padding, the padding here. If it, there's no padding, it's three is to one debt equity for a power project I have taken. But if there's a padding here, the nominal debt equity ratio goes up, but it becomes, in fact, there's no debt, there's no equity there. Mm. Now, let's say the required DSCR is 1.45. So what he's going to do is he is going to pack the cost up to this point, Z point. You know, where he gets up to this point, where he gets his 
full equity. So nominal debt equity ratio is 4.07, but actually is bringing no equity. Right? So what is he doing? The investor's risk is his own investment. He's bringing his investment to zero and it's going to the banks. Right? <laughs> but he's very happy that he's built up big assets. But if the banking team fails to monitor very rigorously, then there'll be more, you know, diversion. Mm. When the valuation is ultimately done, there'll be nothing. What happened to Lanko Baban Power Project? 13 banks and LIC funded. 8,217 crore was the uh, secured claim admitted, of which 7,000 crore approximately was principal alone. The resolution applicant offered just one crore cash and five percent equity, and based on the you know the cost of the equity, it would come to around 112 crore value. Okay, assuming that it will come up, but it was eventually liquidated and it went only for 290 crore. So what are we, what are we saying? Three and a half percent is the recovery, just two and a half crore to to 290 crore. So my point is. The bank's valuation had faltered for various reasons. The bank had allowed far higher investment than it was necessary. The, because it's a constraint. How can the bank have expertise in even evaluating costs? There are ways of doing it. But the banks are under pressure to sanction very fast. Risk mitigation is not there and this happens. So I'm just closing it because then it will be uh, this is the fact of life, actually. So the limited point here is so that when your article is completed yeah. and when it gets published or before or that, one yeah. day we'll have a discussion on that only, full pledge. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, Thank we'll you. request Thank Manoj you. because you. You, this is arising out of your lot of case studies. Yeah. And uh, it is for uh, current bankers and current financers, it has got a lot of. Uh, Inputs. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So from now on, here onwards, I go to, the, you know, from that uh, book. Uh, so, the excellent you saw here, it's a blend of, you know, uh, understanding business strategy, accounting due diligence, financial analysis, and based on that, the prospective uh, uh, estimates. So here, you are looking at the growth and profitability of the company. And to understand this, you look at the product market strategies, the financial market policies, and this is again very nicely picked up. Operating management, see there's, there's an emphasis on operating management and then the investment management. Now we know there are, you know, there are strategies like blue ocean st strategy. Before that, the red ocean strategy. All these strategic theories are there. How did the theories come up? They came up based on certain strategies adopted by the corporates, and the researchers found that yes, there were some, you know, elements of those. When they do it, ultimately, it is the management and organization which matters a lot. So here, operating manage managers of managing revenues and expenses so that you have the cash flow, operating cash flow, managing working capital and, ca and capital assets so you come to the free cash flow to firm. Financing decisions, managing liability and equity. You don't make financial decision which is going to, uh, a, you know, Invite undue financial risk and dividend policy. So managing the payout. This is what he has done from this particular book. And what they have done is they have blended the four prong analysis, which I just talked about, to compare two US companies, TJX and Nordstrom. They have a merchandise, you know, for the people at large. You know, so I can go to Mantra, or I can go to, uh, you know, Amazon, or I can go to Geomart, right? There are, people can go to either of them. 
but they have very divergent strategies. So the point is that even if they have divergent strategies, the analysis is not thwarted. TJX is an off-price competitor. You know, like you must have seen $1 uh, stalls if, if you've gone to the US. And this off-price co competitor that pursues a cost leadership strategy. So this is a cost leadership strategy, and this is a differentiation strategy. So he wants to focus on customer service and differentiated merchandise selection. Now, see the interesting part here. The return on equity. Why return on equity? Because this is the ultimate part. This is ultimate and this regresses to mean after a point. I am not showing that particular side how it regresses to mean over a period of time in that book, but I'm going to probably open that sheet and tell you from the book. I have the soft copy of it. If anybody wants to download the soft copy, it's available in PDF drive. But I use soft copy for searching something, but I have also bought hard copy, which facilitates reading. What is the return on equity here? Reported in the financial statements, 46.5%, 39%, extremely high. But when these are adjusted, this has become far more. And this has become little more. Why is it so? Why is it happening? Let's see. Now, you, same ROE figures reported, adjusted based on net profit, uh, net profit margin, that is return on sales multiplied by asset turnover. This is the asset turnover. See here. Here is asset turnover is coming to very high as reported. Obviously, see if his asset turnover is coming to very high here, and if it's as adjusted, if it is low, doesn't it mean that some of the assets are understated here? How can I understate the asset if I have something off balance sheet? So this is again a blend of financial analysis and the accounting analysis. So this gives the return on assets, which we just discussed, return on assets, assets is 18%, as reported, 9.3%. Here it is 13.4% and 8.8%. Here it is, you know, here it has come down, of course, and both, of, both the uh, cases, it has come down. When you multiply with the financial leverage, you get the return on equity. As reported, of course, Nordstrom, continues to be more leveraged than other. Now, if it is more leveraged, is it running a financial risk? Even that answer is there. Well, if you can service a debt in five years, and if you take a four-year money, then you are definitely inviting financial risk. I often advise my you know, clients who come to me, if you are going to be able to service in five years in the best in the in the most likely case downside case scenario seek eight years settle for at least seven years or six years and keep a put option rather than come into distress and then go for restructuring you will come into tremendous pressure which will impact your business and which will impact your value now what are the accounting adjustments i think it's very obvious to you people what kind of accounting adjustments outsource credit card operations. So asset turnover was also because the credit card operations was outsourced. So his revenue improved. The TGX has more extensive use of off-balance sheet operating leases, which I mentioned. See, financial leases have to be capitalized even in terms of your NAS. I remember the earlier you know, uh, Indian standard, I think it was 19, right? Uh, uh, IS 19, it, had, it has to be capitalized. There is operating leases, but the commitment is there. When the adjustment for operating lease was done, the asset turnover gap is sub which substantially, which we just saw. Then substantially higher ROE for TGX on adjusted basis due to financial leverage. See here. 
his return on asset itself is so high, and this is because of financial leverage. Here it is less, but far more financial leverage. So effectively, what are you doing? If you are borrowing every rupee, you are earning over and above that. If you are borrowing a rupee at let's say ten percent cost, your return on that capital employed is far more. So there is a justification, but what will happen in a downside scenario has to be seen okay so that's what it is this of course this is one bullet it has not been you know combined the higher return on sales that is net margin for the tjs is the result of lower current expenses incurred as a result of operating lease adjustments so what have i tried to say is that okay he has done financial analysis he has done you know the uh, valuation ratio these are all valuation ratios essentially why valuation ratios because if you look at return on equity or you take at return on capital employed or return on assets these are there is these vary in a narrow range in a specific industry there will not be outliers and if there are outliers they will be for a short period there'll be definitely a range the best will have highest the worst will have lowest but the lowest fellow would, might be slipping into uh, uh, bankruptcy so you have to value it based on their performance comparison with the past of its own and the peers these ratios have also been done current ratio we all know this we will not look into this anymore but these ratios three ratios tell you how we are going to meet your liabilities from liquidation of current assets right because they are in the numerators and this shows how much cash flow is have coming from operations and how we are going to manage this so although here there are quick ratios cash ratios are less the current ratios are very substantial but it's a fallacy that current ratio more than one always means results in debt servicing effectively it may be less than one but if this figure is good you have no issue and i would strongly suggest you look at the reliance industry statement his current ratio works out to 0.07 something like that okay there are reasons for that we are not going to that now here another thing the return on equity and the price to book ratio this is what is happening here higher the return on equity obviously there is higher price to book ratio obviously when you are talking of return on equity you are talking of certain multiplier which the buy, the market allows depends on the growth opportunities so this is very consistent just a point here now if you look at forecasting part of it they have blended this four analysis and then they have forecasted so these are the kind of figures which have come up now i am going to open this page number 219 of the book itself because it's not you can't do justice by projecting on the ppt and when i open it i am sure there are going to be definitely questions from you and thereafter we will conclude this and come to one uh, ppt file one excel file for some further figures so one allow point. me meanwhile i see four chats is there any point i have seen okay i see a comment by mr sk vishrinivasan incidentally mr sk vishrinivasan is a former bank of india officer and a, a chemical engineer uh, in he worked in bharat bhaba uh, atomic research center moved to banking bank of india and then the new idba bank in the old idba bank welcome mr uh, shrinivasan he has talked of the dmard versus big bazaar i think this kind of an analysis should be done for dmart and big bazaar also but let me just open right now uh there are other comments as well we will come at the discussion times i'll need about about 10 minutes to conclude this so that we can have a fruitful discussion thereafter let me just open the page number 219 i have kept it ready here you can see the 
Here you can see the thing. Now see here. Now one moment. You can now see fair enough. See here. This is what now what, what see what am I why am I showing this? This is what they projected based on their analysis, and then they applied the validation check, and if they found that this was very, very accurate coming. Okay. There are some practical aspects though. So beginning networking capital plus beginning not net long-term assets coming to this figure. Net debt is this much, and the net capital comes to same, of course. So you are taken care of the assets and the debt. Income statement is projected from 23 billion going up to 40 billion, 40 plus billion in 2020. Operating return on assets, see here. It's a very important parameter. Have you ever heard of operating return on assets? If you pick up Reliance uh, uh, analysis, you'll find many of these portals. In fact, I saw in once, uh, you know, a few months back in uh, Economic Times, uh, fellow says that his return on capital employees has come down to 8%. And in fact, in last discussion, I had even projected. They were <laughs> Ah. There's a big disturbance. Let me just make everyone. Okay. I've done. You can unmute when you want to talk. Well, now. Because the trouble is, you're not taking the operating return on assets. You are taking operating income in the numerator. But in the denominator, you are taking the assets, um, significant part of which are investment whose value is not being reflected in the numerator. Return on common equity, see, it's tapering down. It's tapering down. Why is it tapering down and what is the implication of its valuation? Book value of asset growth rate. The asset growth rate, again, is tapering down. Book value of common equity growth rate. This is what it is. Net operating asset turnover. Slightly coming down. This cannot, you know, go down substantially. If this happens, then your return on equity suffers. Right? But does you go down a little bit. Now, if you look at the cash flow data, free cash flow to equity going up from 1387, 1.4 billion to 1 point, little more than 1.4, then it's tapering down. And free cash flow to capital is coming to this much, to the total. Okay. Now, are we, are we doing it in this fashion? Now, what are the practical problems that we face? What are the practical problems that we face? See here, this I am not, this is the abnormal earning. What is abnormal earning? Abnormal earning is something which is, which goes beyond the, uh, cost of the capital. If my return on equity is 25%, if my cost of capital is, uh, you know, 14%, my abnormal return is 11%. And based on the abnormal return, also you do the valuation. So the ab abnormal ROE is so much. Why 52.1? Because the return on uh, equity was required was very, was much less. Free cash, same figures are there. The equity discount factor because he's taking present value and equity growth factor. So this is how the equity, obviously, first year it's one and then it keeps on growing, right? Now, terminal value, there is a challenge which is, of course, fixing this. I'm not highlighting it, right? So I'll just stop it for the time being now and come back to our PPT. Right? And what happened here overall? What has this approach done? I'm not showing you how it was coming very close to the reality with their model, which you can now see, of course, for yourself. This, this book cannot be com completed in one and a half, two hours. 
and that was not the agenda it was the idea was to sensitize the professionals here preparation of business and financial assumptions for the valuation exercise right that is one that is done based on those four that four from the approach which we discussed preparation of detailed valuation forecasts and terminal values of earning this terminal value is always taken very 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 lightly and i am going to throw open one uh, you know excel and i am going to seek your views manoj ji i will need about 15 minutes to finish okay computation of cost of equity using sure. earned cash flows and rates of returns this is what it was and these are all applicable for our analysis even as lenders as bankers even as mna uh, advisors financial advisors dealing with usual practical issues including accounting this saw that because you have to come to when if you are doing common size statements you cannot allow accounting distortions to distort the whole analysis negative book values it may be there negative book value for the sometime you know if the initial losses and excess cash balance so this is a big 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 problem which you are going to see in excel as well and this fixes that so let us see the practice adopted by the banks for funding new project based on the models and identify improvements so first i am going to show one file where the problem of the three problems there there is a terminal value problem there the valuation forecast problem is there and even the excess cash balance is there and based on that can you imagine whether it could ever be sanctioned i'm just going to open it give me half minute and in fact this i had not planned to give that but it suddenly struck so let me just do that right now i'll take half minute to uh, you know identify that and and open for you just one moment and 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 very crucial thing how the banks are doing things implicitly and how they should be doing explicitly that we will be very clear now about just one moment one minute where are we Well, I'm looking at this. Any question right now? Anybody can ask. Hello. When my phone turn. Can you mute yourself when you are talking? Yeah. Where is it gone? Just one. अच्छा उन्हें मैं सेट करना वीडियो एंड राजेंद्र जी यस प्लीज राजेंद्र यस प्लीज रिगार्डिंग आफ्टर द इंसॉल्वेंसी बैंक बोर्ड हैड मेड अ सेपरेट कैटेगरी ऑफ वैल्यूअर्स विद देयर सेपरेट एग्जामिनेशन एंड ऑल whether you find that this category of valuers are on a more informed and more uh, you know better uh, equipped to handle uh, complicated uh, valuation techniques it's a very tough call it's a very very tough call merely by passing an exam and 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 uh, register doesn't make them you know eminently suited to value in fact at time uh, they started uh, uh, they started lobbying firms to get uh, you know 
registered and there should be a focus on the teams like you know when i say that there are so many uh, mns fail and so many private equity teams also fail what happens actually uh, many times as i mentioned that they get into uh, the deal making but there is one one private equity company which has never failed uh, whose name is uh, uh, bridge point so it has a certain way of doing it it uh, engages a team which has a devil's advocate and that david devil's advocate ensures that there will be absolutely you know no question will be left unanswered so that's how the bias is removed now you know when i i just don't understand why there is a need for a valuer here just for arriving at the allocation to dissenting financial creditor and uh, um, and and operational creditor you need valuation there is no need for valuation in ibc let the bidder do the valuation let ensure a competitive bidding and let the price discovery happens valuation is theoretical here yeah. what was the valuation in case of raj oil the free uh, fair value was 27 crore distress value was 23 crore how much did we uh, eventually get the value to the lenders 62.2 crore how it was done fierce competition that's how it was so i do agree there's a problem here now i am just saying showing you this is one you know case the real case on which a bank did sanction the debt i do not know whether it was you know whether we i have ever you know used uh, whether i used in this forum last time uh, last time but today it's very relevant because there is a valuation embedded in what we are doing here so that is the concluding part going to be so valuation is embedded here now when you are talking of valuation here see here the same cash flow is used for valuation as for determining the irr and or npv cash flow is the same except that for determining the enterprise value you are not considering the investment made right you are essentially taking the free cash flow to firm now see here there are three big blunders the out of the four pronged approach that was given there there are three prongs which are totally haywire okay now one is of course i i, I did highlight uh, that point of course um the the ratio point the uh, the terminal value the valuation forecast have totally gone wrong and therefore the free free cash flows have totally gone wrong okay and therefore the valuation has been so pathetic here uh now can you see this can you see the excel file which i have shared yeah very clearly very clearly now you see here valuation is a dynamic situation Absolutely. and one can uh, have the updates on the models yeah yeah see here the initial outlay the word the phrase is also not very palatable to me it is simply the you know investment okay fair enough i don't will i'll not go into that this is being incurred over five year period no four year period 126.96 crore is rupees crore you see here depreciation is flawed obviously flawed will not i'll not ask you people you are expert the depreciation should have been see if it's for the partial operation there was partial capitalization it could have been lower up to this and then it would have been same so it's wrong fair enough now when you are talking of terminal ratios the treatment for terminal ratios is different if it's a perpetual project then what do you do you have when you are talking of perpetual project you have essentially this kind of a thing you know there's a time this the, the horizontal axis is the 
this is the time period and this is the cash flow period here the cash flow is growing and after having reached a growth phase this is now a steady state phase so you calculate let's say if it's, this point is up to 5 years right then you do cal cash flow for 5 year estimate so the 6 year estimate will be cash flow for 5 years estimated cash flow for 5th year right 6th uh, year divided by weighted average cost of capital minus the growth rate you have a challenge of you know arriving at the growth rate but the book which i mentioned does tell you how you will look at the growth rate it will not be random see mathematically and conceptually this is a superb formula but the practice is an art and ex expertise so when you are doing the practice you will have to find out g and wscc also which bears relation to the facts of life and yes it is dynamic wscc keeps on changing right and which means the sixth year you are going to add the present value of the perpetuity year which is happening here and then you are going to calculate now this particular and what happens if it's a if it's a uh, finite life project like a concession for 15 years 20 years then you are this you are going this will be you know this will be uh, valued for the entire period and the terminal value will be simply because the project is handed over to the companies whatever fixed assets small fixed assets are there you know furniture fixtures etc will remain with the company and which will be a very small amount plus the net working capital minus the cash balance because cash balance has already been accounted for during the you know uh, while taking the free cash flow to firm that's what it's going to be now this is a operating company this is a perpetual uh, uh, life company but he has come up with a terminal value which is 228 crore 228 crore is the terminal value how has it been calculated balance sheet k19 into 5% so what he has done is he has taken the gross fixed assets taken 5% as the as res, you know as a residue salvage value and balance sheet k32 what is k32 here balance sheet k32 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 is here k32 is this is the figure he has simply taken the gross current assets as a terminal value it's conceptually wrong on two counts one This is a perpetual project. You cannot do that. You have to take a terminal value. Number two, even if it were terminal project, it would be, it would be simply not this figure, but it would be this figure minus the current liability figure minus the cash balances because cash balances have come from the operations already. this could have been 2268 not this big figure okay join join now if i do 2268 here what will happen what will happen what will happen to the ir i uh, irr 2268 it comes to 20% and 27 post there was no need for post tax pre state pre tax there was one irr which was there. okay now point is what are the ratios the book also emphasizes we also know intuitively our ratios can't be outlandish we can't have an outlier if you have outlier then we have to have a reason for that is there a proprietary product and the proprietary management technology where nobody will come in qualcom has proprietary technology for cdma but there are others are also, others also who are surviving gsm has been successful so let's quickly look at balance sheet here let's look at yes taken return on equity i have taken 
return on capital employed here. See here. Value, value, value. Capital employed. Yeah. Now, see here. The ROCE is coming to 7%, then jumping to 25.9% when it's a, you know, the, the, the plant has been set up to uh, utilize large power portion of capacity, then it is tapering down. Do you find some, what are the two problems here? The two problems are that the ROCE is looking too good. It is peaking here and then it is going down. Why it's going down? Granted that the ROE regresses to mean, which we show, we saw in the uh, in the book. Yes, you can't have a, a you know uh, abnormal earnings for perpetuity. There may be abnormal earnings for some time, and then the competition will catch up, and then you are going to there will be it will be it will regress to mean. Is it that? That's one thing. Second. 25.9% return on capital employed. Is it really practical? Now let's look at it. If you are looking at capital employed, it is net fixed assets plus net current assets or net worth plus long-term liabilities, right? So this is this, this column, this is based on net worth plus long-term liabilities and this is... Uh, net fixed assets plus net current assets. Now, what happens if I say that, look, this kind of cash balance is impractical. Nobody can have this kind of a cash balance. You know, 159.52 crore, if I have a cash balance, why am I keeping debt? Why am I borrowing from the bank? So let me say that it's 1,000 here. So let me keep this as 1,000. I'll just keep 1,000 lakhs. Okay, so... That's good enough. I let me just make an simple a, 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 an assumption here, and let me see what happens to the ratios here. The ratio has I will say one zero four. Okay. This is a bit divided by capital employed. So B is 103 by B104. And this one is uh, all right, all right, all right, all right. From this, I'm going to reduce. I'm going to simply say that, look, I don't need so much of cash balance. Let me come here. I have 159, uh, the cash balance was, I had a cash balance of how much? One, one fifty nine three two, right? So instead of that, I'll just keep 1,000 lakhs. Let me just do that here in the last, All right? So I'll say minus one, Four nine zero zero. Here, my return on capital employed comes to a whopping figure. If I don't keep so much of you know cash balance, which is impractical. Okay, this is what happens. And hold for a moment. Let me just highlight something very interesting here. One moment. Yeah, this is what it is. It has come to fair enough. What I'm trying to say is that look, if I and uh, oh, another Rajendra ji, yeah, yeah, another my question, yeah, uh, like uh, we take a base figure and uh, after that all these estimation are uh, done during the time of project. Uh, appraisal and project sanction. Yeah, or then, I would rather say Narendra ji, valuation. Yes, since the topic is valuation, when you are appraising, you are indeed valuing. It. You are finding that the enterprise value that you have estimated is really great, and therefore you are giving an X amount of debt, which will, which will be indeed service. That's the assumptions. 
So we are doing essentially valuation. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, no. Only thing is, along with the, that valuation and a certain ex, uh, extent of debt and the relative various pa financial uh, parameters and like your what you said, uh, return on capital employed, return on uh, assets, return on uh, uh, equity, all that. But have you found that when you uh, move forward after a year or third year, fourth year, fifth year or whatever, is that are uh, again monitored with the relevance to the one which you have taken at the time of uh, appraisal or uh, that uh, you uh, uh, real, uh, review it as on that day without any reference to these figures? That is my point. First and foremost, we all know that the actuals will always be different from the estimates. Correct. Right? Uh, which applies during the construction of the project and Correct. also during operations, right? Mm. Now, when the construction is being done, monitoring is absolutely necessary and monitoring uh, uh, will be effective if everything else was structured well, the team, all that stuff, mm. all appraisal is done. Then monitoring is done and it's ensured that the cost incurred and the asset on the ground have a consistency. There's no diversion. Mm. That's right. When it starts operating, the actual will be different from the estimate. It may be better than estimate or it may be less, right? If it's better, that's an upside and the banker will be very happy about it because the bank doesn't, uh, creditor doesn't uh, have the risk of, uh, you know, default. The equity investor did for the upside, so he's getting it fair enough, right? The point is, on what basis did the lender accept those figures? Now, initially itself, I said that 50% MNS fail and mergers of acquisition fail even 70% worldwide. Mm. That is because the moment you have to sanction, if you are a creditor, you get into that mold, you lose sight of the due diligence. Mm. That's what is happening. So one during appraisals, some biases are creeping in and things are being done. During monitoring, there is a massive mismatch. There is a belief, a, a solemn belief that the money is going for actual asset on the ground. And then during operations again, when you know somebody is doing day to day, he takes money out in so many ways. Mm. Related party transactions without even those being qualified as related party, there are ways of doing it. That will be, you know, all done. So that's where the uh, monitoring fails. Then again, the legislation, credit recovery fails. That's what it is. But the first and the foremost is if the valuation in the beginning itself is robust, then mm. there is a skin in the game for the, uh, for the promoter also because he knows that his value is going to go up only. Otherwise, you will, you will have a Lanco kind of a Babant kind of a case. If I read that credit appraisal note, I feel that the bank was dying to give him money. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know like you. So that's a different subject. So, Anyhow, so okay. So, this is the to give a, this one, how the valuation is important in a project appraisal. That is what important, correct? Absolutely. And Absolutely. what are the methodology, and how do you arrive at uh, various now, uh, ratios? Yeah, I'm now coming to the uh, to the <coughs> to that uh, you know how the banks are indeed doing valuation, but they are doing it implicitly. So allow me to open one slide, another five minutes, Manoj. Yeah? Then I'm closing it. Allow me. A couple of Hello. Good to see many practical issues here. Uh, there are many experts here. Uh, Mr. Sanjeev Pandey? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You are there? Yes, Anujji, let me just, let me just uh, uh, finish this in the next five minutes and then we'll have a discussion. Okay. Now, here it is. See. See. When you are talking essentially, your free cash flow to firm is this, which we saw earlier. Now, a bit multiplied by one minus tax rate is 
EBIT into one minus tax rate and I into one minus tax rate, and this portion is profit after tax plus I into one minus tax rate means profit after tax plus I minus interest into tax rate. So minus interest into tax rate is the depreciation, in, sorry, interest tax shield, which is being taken out from the cash flow for the for arriving at the total cash flow, right? Now, if that total cash flow is to be discounted for NPV, the WACC will have to be to have will have to include that which is post tax. But habitually, we do not remove this I minus tax rate. We do not remove the interest tax shield. And if we do not remove interest tax shield. Let's do the right conceptual thing. Um, right? Let's have a WACC where the debt is not post tax. Otherwise, it's a double counting. And if you remove this interest tax and then discount it with, you know, WACC with post, post tax cost of debt, you are committing a grave error. Okay. Now, why am, I, why am I saying that it's an implicit valuation by the banks, right? When you are talking of, see, when you are doing IRR, in fact, I don't prefer IRR. It should be modified IRR, if at all. Your initial cash flow is the project cost that you are incurring. Then the operating cash flow is one. And then the terminal cash flow. Terminal cash flow, uh, there is a certain treatment for... Uh, for a finite life project like a concession period or an SPV, and there's a very sophisticated approach for the perpetual project cash flow, where the G cannot be just you know uh, you know out of blue estimated. It has to be very properly estimated, and the book highlights it very well. You do it now. These two things, second and third, are actually the free cash flow to firm till the end of the project or till perpetuity. This is the valuation which the banks are doing. But they never say that this is my value. Minus this investment which they do. Right? They don't come up with V minus I and that is equal to net present value. They instead calculate IRR. I have no dispute with that. I would emphasize two things. Rather three things. One, Definitely do IRR, but do not use IRR formula, use modified IRR. Because reinvestment rates cannot be assumed at the same rate of IRR. It's outlandish. That's one. Okay. Now let's assume that IRR is being called as MIRR. The second point is calculate WACC. The banks simply talk of IRR and they don't do WACC. What are they doing? Right? So be explicit. And say that, look, this is my value that I'm getting. I have discounted it at WACC. And my I is less. So my value is far exceeding this. And this valuation, fact of life is that investment bankers fail 50% or more. Despite enormous due diligence, the banks work under pressure. If they fail 50% in new project, it will no, be no surprise. And that's what is happening because this V during implicit, you know, estimation, the subtleties are totally missed out. So I'm saying that the bank simply said, I have done a valuation. I have removed a distortion of WCC estimates. I have removed the distortion of IRR estimation. I have come up with a base case value which is very practical. It meets the test of peer comparison and also its own past performance. I cannot expect a return on capital employed of 30% if in the past, last year it was 15%. So yes, the past historical performance after removing accounting distortions must stack up vis-a-vis -vis the current estimates it must also stack up vis-a-vis -vis the peers, right? There will be variation, 
but let there be no outlier allowed for any comparison if you are an outlier bring it down finally the the wish you saw huge amount of cash balance in the projection of this this was a crazy projection on which funding was done by a bank and it had to go for for a toss it went for a toss why it happens do the bank bankers not know this no they are the people with guts they know the business extremely well but they work under enormous pressure nobody has time to go through these valuations i'll not say appraisal i'm going to say valuation we are talking of valuations so valuation is happening day in and day out right and that's how it's happening and when you talk of cash balance now these cash balance let's quickly look at final one minute your five kinds of current assets your short term investments right cash and bank balances inventories receivables and other current assets now in the projection we often miss out the other current assets which are the prepaid cost even prepaid taxes there may be some advances made to even employees but that's not more it is other things so even those should be captured and even if after that if there is a cash balance it should be shifted to cash strap account for the use by the bank and the bank should adopt it as a practice so that the valuations cannot go away by the moment you look at the cash balance you say oh what the heck this is a cash balance 150 100 crore in the 6th year pay off the entire debt make the repayment schedule as the promoter he'll go mad about it that itself will you know resolve the valuation issues ladies and gentlemen thanks i've taken you longer time than i imagined now i stop this and i throw it for discussion really a very very incisive uh, presentation with uh, practical issues how valuations can change valuation dynamics so many models we talked about forecasting we talked about practical issues companies power companies reliance industry uh, a deep dive much more interaction uh let's have practical issues how various stakeholders look at uh valuations evolving uh, stage valuations uh, uh, we talked about uh different valuation uh also distress valuation and stakeholder valuations uh, when it actually happen it can even be 1.5x of the earlier uh, valuation de defined by the valuer it can be even 2x it all depends on the business uh it all depends on the business uh, potential the management how dynamic they are uh, what is a uh, what is a uh, uh, governance uh, by the new management it can really multiply or it can uh, die depends uh, on the mismanagement there are so many experts here let's have different views from the 360 degree perspective as usual mr pandey mr bhatia yes, we have many many experts here many many speakers mr pandey you are there with us now yes yes good afternoon Yeah, yeah. Good afternoon. Yeah. Really welcome. Yeah. Uh, just put your video on, Mr. Pandey, well-known expert uh, banking, uh, uh, with the best bank of India, State Bank of India. Whenever we talk about valuation, we talk about business. We talk about valuation of SBI also, going from height to height. It has tripled this year, Mr. Pandey. Uh, the way you look at valuations, the way you look at uh, financial statements, the way you look at the dynamism of valuation, how relevant or not relevant it is, your perspective. And also the way uh, foreign deans, foreign universities, Harvard, uh, they look at valuation because they interact with lots of Fortune five hundred companies. They are also advisors. Now more and more uh, top companies are coming from India. Even Fortune five hundred companies have got CEOs from India, top management from India. 
it's the india growth story number one moving ahead very fast static integrity and more valuation and more equity we are at a new high for the year and since yeah thank you thank you manoj ji so my understanding of valuation has i think improved after going through this ibc in last 5 years it has given us a real sense of the importance of valuation actually and now we realize much better that underlying any npa or the cause of npa is the valuation so that was something uh, missing in the uh, understanding of bankers earlier so valuation was more of a uh, just a routine exercise where we have to get a valuation nobody took it really seriously and that's why it was also a not a regulated uh, kind of a profession so most of the time what valuers were doing was like kind of satisfying the parties like the borrower or the banker what kind of valuation so it was not really uh, some professional kind of valuation happening in india with ibc and now the regulation of valuation profession i think we have covered a long distance we have covered a really a big big gap in the way we do business and we do lending or underwriting i'll tell you one uh, small anecdote i was uh, undergoing a a course in options in singapore and then uh, suddenly my my coach there he gave a very excellent idea how to look at valuation he said that when a banker gives a loan basically he is selling an option and what exactly that option is it is basically option to the borrower to default or not to default that is called we call it credit risk basically in banking parlance so now there lies the importance of valuation that the borrower is all the time knowing his valuation the best valuer is the borrower who is the promoter or the owner of the i think he is the best valuer in the market he knows the value of his firm daily like in morning he knows what is my value in the night he knows the value any external valuer will only make a guess but the best valuer for a asset is the owner of this he knows best the what is the value my and he is all the time guessing or trying to match that value or compare that value with the amount of debt or loan he has he is carrying or liability so the moment his uh, value goes down and the amount of liabilities is higher he is basically as an option holder in the money so he can exercise the option of default so that is the fundamental of economics or finance which i could understand there and i think if we we keep this in mind many of my uh, colleagues yeah anybody just uh, put your mics on hold yeah so that is the importance of valuation that if we have our valuation right and if we keep the the loan amount also the liability of the borrower in comparison to the value to maintain some kind of margin then i think very few loans will go into the npa category but the missing part is that we don't do that very professionally and now with this uh, valuation uh, more professional valuation i think that gap is covered and i think mr ganatra gave a very good sense of how to value the assets in a uh, by different ways i think we should enhance our game of assessment of underwriting by adopting newer techniques which are already available in the market like in western countries we should bring those standards valuation standard valuation techniques and I apply it to i think day to day lending then then we will see much better outcome from our loans so, sanju sanju ji, sanju ji uh, manoj yes, manoj yeah i would just like to add uh, the no. valuation standard the ici valuation standard the chairman was in uh, talk with me uh continuously over the session and there are committee members from valuation standards board of ici uh they are very very happy with the uh, interactive sessions the valuation being uh, discussed practical issues the corporate issues really really very happy and the valuation standard board uh, has come out with the valuation standard uh, which have the best practices and uh, ici wants that to be followed in letter and spirit and uh, very uh, very highly appreciated the think tank uh, india growth story discussion with ceo cfo cxos 
uh, regularly and top specialist. Yes, Mr. Narendra, some thoughts from you on valuation standard boards of IT also and practical deep dive issues on corporate sector. No, no, no. That uh, I had asked three, four questions already to Rajendra ji. I, so I am asking again, uh, of course, uh, because as you rightly said, Sanjeev and all, that uh, there are uh, knowledge within the oh, bank, bank, there are technical there are, analysis, there are uh, there experts are, who are from individual are, industry, industry experts. experts. And I recently found uh, that, uh, including State Bank of India, arising out of our... Uh, last uh, the phase of 10 years of this uh, whatever no that the npa being higher and also the uh, particularly in the infrastructure sector and all that they have started recruiting experts in the also, bank yeah. and as he rightly said the policy relating to lending and then underwriting standards would have undergone a lot of changes and uh, as he rightly said the ibc also, but that was my question to Rajendra also, after uh, getting the people qualified in the IBC, that IBBI valuation, how far their competence is much, much better than others. Uh, so it is not merely exam. So they have to follow certain principles and they have to have a thorough knowledge of the subject. They have to also look like Rajendra has mentioned that not only the Indian practices, global practices, and they have to vet it by some of the case studies and uh, with the those uh, experience and other things. And as he rightly said, it is not uh, for each and every case. As you need, we will adjust the principles of valuation in different methodology and arrive at the valuation you need. If that is the made to order uh, methodology, uh, that may not really uh, no, benefit. It should be the independence of the valuers uh, and their uh, whatever, no, that professionalism has to be maintained. So in this regard, I was to ask one question to, uh, because continuing the valuation, I was to ask uh, one question to Sanju also, Pandeji, that you said uh, with the lot of knowledge on the this recovery visa with the value, valuation and the difficulty we experienced and even in the IBC cases also. So what is that uh, feedback has been given to policy level and what are the tech uh, uh, improvements if it is done? So that I wanted to hear from Sanjeevji. Sir, one uh, major contribution of IBC or the assets uh, sold or transferred uh, under IBC is that it is creating certain uh, benchmarks for valuation. So that was not available earlier. So that is a very good uh, level of knowledge gain or uh, some uh, market feedback for the value. Otherwise, whatever standards you apply or whatever training you make, ultimately it is the market value which has to provide certain standards. In the earlier uh, regime, there was no market valuation asset for many assets. Now what the IBC or the resolution and liquidation under IBC they are throwing a lot of numbers, which are very, very important for the values to use as benchmark. Like we now know that a steel plant per million ton, what will be the benchmark for that? After going through this bush and steel, SR steel transaction, so we can make certain benchmark, which was not available. Similarly, in many other industries, those benchmarks are being created. That is one big contribution of IBC. But again, I think this, uh, as we say that valuation is a art and a science. So this will grow with the experience. We cannot give a lot of, just by training, we can say that a valuer profession will grow. No, it is just one part of it. Other part is the valuation standard. Third part is the market benchmark. Then fourth important part will be the experience, what our valuers gain in the market. And ultimately the valuation they gave and what ultimately how much the asset was sold. That comparison when you see, then only our valuers will reach a level of maturity. So that I think will take some time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dr. Ganatra, uh, I would like to uh, address this issue and also the way you think about the valuation standards of ICI. Are they relevant? Are they useful? Do they need to change and be practical? Because a lot of hard work is going on on uh, preparing valuation standards and updating it or if you are not aware of it also. 
and then i would like uh, mr sanjeev pandey to respond to the valuation standards brought out by icci how relevant they are and if they are useful or they need to be modified and updated manoj ji before you know this is taken up i just wanted want everyone to look at this slide which i had mentioned but i had missed out you can see this the capital yeah, wonderful, has wonderful insights right from 1926 onwards it gives lot of data from 1926 onwards my point here is see these are the betas which are calculated yes long term now depending on the size the smallest firm when you are calculating beta in in, in excess of uh, ipm percentage 6.4 so if a small firm it, it was 1.41 was estimated it it was actually 1.41 into point 1 into 1.04 but this decreases for the large ones well traded firms do not have much of a deviation from this model so this is a very robust model scheme but when we are using it let's see if there is you know any indian um, study of this kind or let's capture certain parameter which differentiate it with others in the peer and then use it But definitely the equity value has to be used uh, has to be determined equity cost has to be determined though uh, on the ground it is something which the investor wants right it has to be determined because it has to be consistent with the market that's all that was missed out uh, some insight coming is uh, since 1926 over 85 years of data trends analyzed uh, beta is uh, coming down firms are becoming larger but the average annual return stock uh, return also from 26 onwards have been coming down uh, on a regular basis very very critical insight is it because of economy of scale is it because of competition is it because of private players it is because of entrepreneurs lots of things are coming in in a data presented for over 80 years really wonderful insight yeah some thought uh, mr narendra mr bhartiya mr santosh yeah may i say something yeah wonderful just uh, introduce yourself your name company name yeah, my name is uh, devya kanotya uh <clears throat> i think on the whole issue of valuation name and qualification and company name for benefit of all yeah <clears throat> so i am an investor and i am running in nbfc on a very small scale my name is devya kanotya i am a industrial engineering graduate from university of michigan i have done my masters degree in wonderful to have you here yeah please yeah. share your thoughts so, <clears throat> i think there are several models for valuation many of which have been discussed today and while we find that many companies show up good valuation based on these formulas which have been discussed and many other formula which are existing yet <clears throat> suddenly we find that these companies turn into npas and they are detected very late the big question over here i think is that lenders who are lending in the working capital space are not doing enough due diligence of current assets see those there are two kinds of promoters <laughs> one is uh, the unscrupulous promoters who are diverting funds away and the balance sheet uh, does not show the diversion very transparently so it's only later on that you realize that the funds have been diverted away and there are others who are honest promoters but the business fails in both cases if the working capital management or other working capital scrutiny is done by the lenders by evaluating every head like the inventory the uh, other assets and the debtors and seeing their age quite significantly you will find that as the age of the inventory and debtors keeps increasing it's a very sure sign of incipient sickness which is going to uh, be caught at a later date when the you will be trying to bolt the stable after the horses have run away so i think the working capital scrutiny of ongoing firms is extremely necessary 
in order to prevent a huge haircuts being taken by lenders and creditors i don't know if anyone can throw some light on this whether this is being done properly or not sure sure uh, thank you very much yeah and a very practical issue is being raised yeah sanjay please respond yeah yeah no no it was very very valid point raised by my friend so that is the problem uh, with the banking sector today and that is the problem we are facing uh, while resolving the assets also then most of the time the current assets are missing when the company goes into insolvency right so right. the the biggest losers are the working capital lenders because there are no current assets on the table other reasons are few one of the fundamental reason here is that we are still following that cash rate kind of a loan facility which has outlived its utility actually so i think first uh, thing we can do or what rbi can do is to remove that uh, cc facility which is a like which always keep on growing it's never come back so today i give a loan of 1 crore cc to some company next year it comes back with a 2 crore requirement then 4 crore and after a certain years they will just make a default when we go out to recover nothing is there so i think uh, as in the west no such facility they use they use a trust receipt they use other kind of facility or a demand loan uh, but they no country is using this facility cash credit which is actually just a uh, kind of a perpetual loan given to a borrower so that is one solution i can say second thing is that uh, the very meaningful stock audits are very very important although yes. banks are doing yes. it yes and that yes. they should be more frequent like i would say every six month especially and then look out for non moving assets and then look out for stale assets like the other day i was looking at a loan from a designer he is a very uh, like the famous designer and suddenly and our branch was very very confident that this is a very good company and very good brand but we went, when we went through the stocks we saw that lot of excess material because every garment company creates some extra stock while making an order the so like 20 30 percent extra which is either sold in the market or unsellable but those were shown as current stocks receivables are not checked mostly so same receivable keep on recurring so this kind of like uh, stock, stock statement analysis is very very important so when the person analyst doing a stock statement so he should look for repetitive receivables many of time we have seen many companies are just uh, paper companies giving uh, receivable receipts so you must be seeing now many of the under gst many of these uh, companies are going behind bar the promoters because they are in the market just to issue invoices so now actually gst also is putting a cut to this but this is rampant so fake receivables are rampant so i think best suggestion is to go for verification of receivables also and to right and remove all these such receivables so oh. collateral management yeah yes 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 collateral management is also missing in india so actually no banker can sit in a unit and keep on watching the stocks all the time as we have seen in the case of like rice rice seller basmati producing companies what they do many of these companies have gone bust they have removed the entire stock overnight like they, they can just fill some trucks and remove the stock so even we are doing whatever like stock audit or regular inspections the borrower can just remove the stock and sell it this is cash basically this commodity like cotton rice like oil so these are like cash commodities can be removed at short notice so here i think we need some kind of uh, collateral management agency who can take over this business of uh, keeping a track of collaterals for cc working capital limit from the banker and provide some credit announcement so i think these are the things the bank can do but yeah first thing is that this limit should be reviewed so this kind of cash rate limit i think this is a poses a big risk for the bank rather than giving a cash credit we should give a kind of revolving kind of credit for maybe two years three years and every year it should be reviewed any sign of delinquency or like of possibility of default the bank should recall the limit thank you sanjeev that uh, see as uh, kanuria said that uh, i have been uh, some time back in the when i was talking also that the credit risk lies in the decision taken by the promoter or the client 
what decision he takes in terms of you know core non core or uh, like you know what is meant for uh, business what is meant for personal drawings or all that it's have a direct impact on the bank but uh, bank per se in spite of our saying credit management all that credit uh, management in relation to ratios and all that on a particular day we analyze and uh, we provide the work, working capital and all now ideally the working capital cycle and the entire aspect of uh, from whom he is purchasing and what is the uh, inventory levels what we normally have that inventory levels and uh, number of months all that even stock in process all that all have to be got incorporated into our technology in such a way that uh, uh, none of the parties who are not figuring in that the money should not be allowed to uh, taken away and no drawing will be allowed unless it is uh, proved what what purpose because in a way that way cash transaction should have to be avoided now this uh, we have not done as you rightly said at the time of renewal and enhancement everybody will become active and this man will give out of projection and whole idea is aaj to 100 crore hai kal to usko 200 crore karu kya basis pe kaise wo to simply we see the transaction summary and all we see but another thing is today is a centralized clearing so this checks relation to what you call payments come to the centralized clearing now that man will see what is the drawing power which is incorporated and if it is as per that and it is a all the other signature tally he passes and after that it is a post mortem that comes to the branch and just uh, you are passing the entry directly actually it is passed directly only so now where is the control so that is where quite a lot of customers have understood the weakness in the banking uh, thing and they are making a uh, complete utilization of that or means misutilizing that's where in the foreign bank and all as he rightly said they will give a cash flow method and they will not give just like a running account or a, your a cash credit overdraft even overdraft can be given provided it is on a diminishing scale ideally any cash credit account in a period of 5 years should become nil and that's where we normally have okay next year the limit is lower lower, lower so lower, that uh, his uh, cash flow gets uh, enhanced with this own uh, what you call working capital working margin capital going margin on going. account of the profit margin now when we don't do that he feels that uh, i am entitled to take entire money out and that's where he says okay to pehle chota chota account mein kya karega hamara ghar banayenge hamara acha सभी घर वालों को कार दे देंगे और थोड़ा ज्वेलरी लेंगे ऐसा दैट दे विल डू बट इन एटलीस्ट देर द एस एम ई मैन इज डूइंग सम दैट बट इन बिग बिजनेस इट इज इन एक्सॉर्बिडेंट रेट दे डाइवर्ट द बैंक फंड सो वी एंड अनदर थिंग सपोज वी आर ऑल फाइनेंस फॉर ए पर्टिकुलर पर्पज हाउ कम ए बोरोवर कैन गो इन टू अनदर लाइन ऑफ बिजनेस जस्ट बिकॉज ही डिसाइड्स and uh, utilize this money for that business he cannot and as rajendra said that uh, that uh, the entire equity what he was giving it by enhancing the projection uh, of the project cost higher even in term loan he will see to that the earliest he is taken out the uh, equity and the only the bank loan will remain in the bank so in all that i think technology must be made full use artificial intelligence machine learning and all that and as we do for a small retail loan why not corporate account that's where today uh, some of the banks have come in that complete the what you call working capital cycle including the inventory to receivable is captured in the bank uh, package so that none can be allowed to uh, misutilize that that uh, is uh, i think state bank should take the lead that is my idea uh, uh, thanks mr narendra for your valuable views your thoughts on a pointed question on uh, ici valuation standards the way you look at it as a banker uh, are they useful or you have people are not aware of it or they need to be updated i i saw abhi 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 dekha wo ici ice ka standard 2018 mein aaya i think but uh, yeah. yeah yeah so that is a later part of that but uh, i think what we have to do if the standards have come 
the institute of chartered accountant or institute of cost and management account looking at all the ibc cases in line with the ibbi which is the now the regulator for valuer in terms of that uh, there may be some uh, standards and others will have to be gone into in a way like you no know, now recently as the committee of creditors the code, uh, code of conduct similarly in the liquidity your liquidation that not more than two bidders or no two revisions then a swiss challenge method all that is coming out of the uh, last five years experience so similarly there is a necessity maybe that in you of the valuation which is as rajendra has so showed how that is relevant and as sanju has said that when he really went through the uh, some of the cases which came into ibc uh, i also earlier told rajendra also that uh, my experience has been when it comes to recovery the valuation given earlier vis a vis the current valuation so much difference so what are those uh, standard improvement to be done and how these experiences can be incorporated to that and uh, how these standards are also in relevant to the international standards i think uh, manoj ji aur aur ek din thoda detail ja ke discuss karna padega but yes. as such there is a need for uh, making a committee because 2018 and we have come to 2021 and uh, the 2018 also would have uh, taken uh, maybe it was uh, before the 2016 ibba or means ibc code so some more input could be gone into that and uh, one of the in the institute also in that there must be a banker from state bank there must be a regulator from the reserve bank uh, one member in that while they form the uh, what do you call Uh, these standards so that uh, the practical or uh, from iba they can take a representative and uh, work on that and come in the much more improvement that is my idea exactly and also people from nfra uh, yes. and mca also it is very important they participate in all the three institute activities correct they have been contributing a lot uh, mr sanjeev pande your thoughts on the valuation standards how relevant they are and any improvement you are suggesting because the valuation standard boards uh, feels they are doing a very lot of hard work and uh, many of them are participating in today's event also i my sense is that uh, most of the valuation standard adopted by us are i think adopted from the western uh, world so uk standard and us most of them have brought in so we are yet to develop our own standards because we must appreciate that india is not a overall a big formal market still so a big part of our economy works informally that we have realized under ibc also that most of the buyers of liquidation assets or even under resolution they came come from informal sector many of the assets is kabadi local kabadis are buying in under liquidation and so that is the fact of life so, so you have to fit your standard with the realities of the market so we cannot just bring a uk system because uk is a very very formal market. for every every sale of loan bad loan or every sale of a, a used asset there is a very very well developed market there you can really discover the value here it is yet to be established and that is one challenge we are facing at ibc if there is no formal market as such ibbi is trying to do that but it will take some time so our standard should take uh, into consideration this fact and then work accordingly like tweak this standard to fit into the indian kind of real that is my very good and some thoughts on the foreign and uh, manoj ji yeah. manoj ji that uh, they have taken in that uh, representative from reserve bank of india representative from sc so you were a securities exchange representative yeah. iba all are there in that uh, when they formed that so now maybe there may be necessity to relook only yes interactive discussion through regular consultation papers yes right that's very very important uh, uh santosh you are with us yes yes manoj ji yeah, your thoughts on your thoughts on the valuation standards also brought out by the institute they are saying they are doing a lot of hard work and uh, sanjeev pande has clearly said they needs to be you know indianized and be more relevant and practical and we'll be having detailed uh, sessions also suggested by mr narendra on this uh, going forward 
No, I agree. I mean, Manoj, and also the various consultations paper have been brought out by regulators to take India a growth story forward at the forefront of the global. Yeah. No, I feel uh, the standards are there in place, so I I don't see any. I don't have any specific uh, thoughts with respect to what are the changes required. I think the representation, as Mr. Narendra said, representations are also there. uh what perhaps uh as we go ahead and we have the experience of ibc and as uh, you know some of the panelists also mentioned including mr ganatra that in ibc cases or otherwise, otherwise or in these um, uh instances like kingfisher where you know the tangible assets were uh, valued for 25000 crores uh right before the 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 fallout uh in such instances i believe there has to be some checks you know in uh in we have this checks of uh, nefra or uh, frrb in case of financial reporting where basically you have an independent uh, committee which looks into the completeness accuracy and the validity of the financial reporting by a uh, major listed companies and gives its comments i think on similar lines uh, there has to be a body either uh, you know uh, at ibbi level or maybe at the institute level where basically you need to have a a kind of a, a review where there is a significant delta between the actual transaction mr ganatra mentioned about uh, you know raj oil mills where the uh, difference between the valuation and the actual uh, closure was there was a significant difference so i think in such instances there has to be some uh, some review by uh, independent uh, regulator as to what went wrong with the valuation and was it you know a subsequent development whether the valuation assumptions basis etc were uh, were reasonable so i think that kind of a check is required a uh, doctor ganatra your thoughts on valuation standard board and how relevant they are they have been brought out since 2018 i also have very similar views to what sanjeev ji mentioned they they are they are statement of very good intent but their practicality has to be tested yet i think i treat them as you know teasers kind of the thing because see if you pick up valuation reports you know once uh, a vpo you know valuation this you know who who uh, register who empanel the valuers like ipas sent me half a dozen valuations for my comments everyone was you know capturing certain text as a routine you know perfunctory you know uh, addition of certain text about methodology etc etc but what they were doing was something which was inconsistent with what they were stating so yes it's a matter of time before uh, this could become practical i have an issue about practicality today exactly very important and uh, dr ganatra one very very important view and fra has come out with a consultation paper uh, which has uh, i and the storm they want to take india forward india india growth story and lot of unnecessarily compliances which are meaningless uh, they have some thoughts and many people have interacted with uh, nfra on that your thoughts on consultation papers of nfra i haven't been able to go through it yet would like you to go through it and also i uh, will be having deep dive regular sessions uh, uh mr narendra your thought on the work nfra has been doing taking india to the next stage of the india growth story at the forefront in the world with ease of doing business no no that is uh, national uh, financial reporting authority now they have uh, gone through uh, quite a lot of uh, companies uh, you know balance sheet uh, and the statement of account disclosure annual report uh, fully and in relation to accounting standards uh, and the auditors uh, uh, you know that whatever report and all uh, particularly auditors report they have would have also come with the uh, such report and uh, like ilfs was the one case they have put up 
in the website and the later consequence of that some action or uh, of course it went to court and all finally some action has been taken and also the entire auditing standards also institute also has been uh, improving upon that and uh, now the nfara has the power uh, to go through any listed company balance sheet and uh, come with the, their opinion how the audit uh, has been done and as they truly represent in terms of the disclosure as well as the their opinion given on that and uh, the financial reporting uh, is it perfectly done and can the minority investors and other shareholders uh, gets the proper information other than what uh, sebi sebi also takes steps now in that uh, recently one uh, i think uh, i have not gone only the paper report i am seeing that they come up with a paper where uh, uh, they have gone through so many companies uh, balance sheets and uh, the auditors cost and some of the particularly smaller msmes when they found uh, the auditor cost and the purpose which is serving by getting it audited some of the smaller msme accounts maybe with the turnover of 50 crores 100 crores and then they came with up to 250 crores uh, they feel that uh, can we dispense with the audit itself and because today gst and other things you are able to derive at the overall what is their uh, purchases and what is their uh, turnover uh, sales and who are their purchase from where they are purchasing are they selling and that data uh, you can arrive at what is your margin of profit and what are the other thing and uh, with the uh, whatever data given by the msme with the balance sheet done without the audit also if they are given to the bank bank or the financing institution as well as the regulator or the taxing authority now today all of them are able to get the linkage the pan your aadhar then the gst and the income tax all those government and customs all the government agency in relation to direct and indirect taxes and uh, these uh, invoice and other uh, what you call the whole thing is now captured and having that being a integrated system uh, today that uh, facility when it is given to bank also bank will be able to get a full details similarly the bank's transaction also are integrated in a way so today it is a totally digitized uh, environment now why do you spend one second why do you unnecessarily insist for uh, audit for a such a small msme and he has to spend uh, lot of money and uh, is it really he has done all the due diligence or uh, some of them has been you no know, where he uh, they have been there and they are just uh, signing that is also so it has been our experience also in uh, finally when uh, iba level and all there are a lot of uh, cases where complaints have come on the professionals where uh, uh, the actual fact of the balance sheet vis a vis that so but of course it is not uh, now it is quite to change and the regulatory tightness has also been done and a lot of improvements have been done and financial uh, control and uh, what i call internal financial control and all that is again board of directors also will have to give uh, their statement all that and finally it is a response with the board of directors also so re, that type of uh, uh, deviation cannot be done but so in the case of small msme but uh, we find quite a lot of articles coming where if you would uh, say that it may be appropriate for a certain level suppose why not we start up to 50 crores uh, that audit per se is not required so later after seeing the experience can we take it to 100 crores or later to the 250 which they have i think uh, it will uh, uh, result or it will uh, uh, get a lot of feedback and msme per se who are now getting into the mode of government registration see that uh, udyog mitra and all that registration is there and without the registration they are not eligible for any of the concession or subsidy or whatever benefits government is giving now that is also getting formalized so once a formalized msme within that parameter of ecosystem i think uh, 
uh, that up to a certain level can it uh, can be looked at so i think government also will look but it is not uh, so fast they will do it is a gradually this type of suggestion by the nfra and uh, but as uh, manoj has said the institute per se uh, i don't know but uh, they are <laughs> there have been some uh, reports also that uh, uh, it has not been arrived at this report with the consultation with the institute so that you know that they may have to gone into debt de with the deep that you are de in deep or uh, in a or a holistic manner and then uh, th the decision can be taken so Manu manoj wa right. wants you no know, Yes. me to tell that there is wo hum batayega nahi but uh, these things are all good uh, developments yes and uh, and uh, uh, financial media also print papers are coming out with incisive studies very yeah. uh, exhaustive article in the economic times uh, hindu business line uh, mint uh, business standard this are a time for deep dive and discussions uh, even icci has invited a uh, uh, response from cas Uh, uh because msme standard uh, people are saying there is a need for the r msmes need the appropriate guidance to appropriate standard mr kannan you are there with us your insights yeah I, uh, yeah yeah the, the need for msme standard and uh, uh, approach paper of N nfra to bring india to the next stage at the forefront in the india grow story who is out doing business is your compliances yeah the moving yeah. necessary compliances and also the contribution multidisciplinary uh, professionals can do to take the story forward see msme nf nfra was looking at saying that uh, they may not require the statutory audit <clears throat> in fact if you see the global corporate governance principles as pres prescribed by oecd When we say corporate governance, it is not only statutory corporate governance. In fact, all companies require good governance. Why we see very high level of sickness in MSMEs is that they don't know most of the time how to manage. Uh, mainly, it is related to financial management. Mainly, it is related to working capital management. That is where they become sick. So now, this recommendation saying that uh, no statutory audit is required. Uh, i see that it is going back in fact uh, when we are saying that we want to formalize the economy in a bigger way and we want uh, everybody to come on stream in the gdp when we say that you don't request statutory accounts means already we know that many of them have practices where they keep the two types of accounts and when you say that you don't request statutory accounts then we will find that many more will go back to that system and actually they don't realize that uh, when you have a as it was clearly brought out by uh, uh, dr ganatra and others uh, uh, today how the valuation is being done how they take the loans and all that so they show they are doing well 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 for four five years and suddenly they take a big loan and they default so those type of approaches actually now you are going towards a concept where i love the digitization even today as we are all aware uh, uh, institution like uh, trans union civil it has credit records of more than 60 crore entities in india including individuals based on the digital footprint so if you have to strengthen this and make msm is more robust in fact uh, the concept of not doing a statutory audit maybe we can find a ways and means by which they can be done cheaper it is possible in today's world where we have digital tools so the auditors can use digital tools to do the audit because the transactions in msmes may not be very large there are msmes where you will find only 10 transactions per month or maybe only 50 transactions per month only 100 so the audit so we can find out a way by which the audit can be done cheaper but the concept of not doing a statutory audit i am not with that that's one and uh, like last time we discussed uh, dr narendra also suggested msmes are the backbone of the economy in fact most of the time they are either dealers or they are suppliers to large companies so one system if you ask me 
fifty percent of MSMEs actually they don't take loans from anyone. But they make so much profit. They they retain the profit, and since they don't want any scrutiny from any outsiders, fifty percent of MSMEs, if you ask me, they don't take any loans at all. They depend on their self uh, their self reliant to their funds. and uh, because they don't want to get noticed by tax authorities they don't want to get noticed by other authorities so most of the time what these people do many msmes unlike what you are thinking that msmes means they are not profitable i'll give you a simple example if you do retail on a small store your gross margin is 18% your operating margin is 18% your net margin is 16% where they don't pay tax you do uh, retail on a large scale large scale they start with 30 235% gross margin and many a times we find a net margin of 1 or 2% or minus 5% that is what we see in large retail companies we think e-commerce companies they have gross margins on the products they sell in their own name is 65% whereas they end up reporting a Loss of 200 to 300 percent. Of course, there are reasons like advertisement and all. So, if you ask me, inherently, MSMEs are a very good, a very good business model. That is why you know the 7-11 model, which Lens is going to adopt. Many of you must notice when you are traveling in our country in the world, 7-11 is nothing but a small grocer model. There are only 500 square foot. They will keep only about two hundred to three hundred estate top keeping units, and these products are turned over every two days. So the productivity level is very very high. So that seven level model is a good model if you have gone to Japan, if you have gone to Thailand, in the US, and they are open twenty four hours a day, and you will find uh, two shops after one seven uh, eleven, opposite one seven eleven. So MSMEs by nature. they are a very good system like what was discussed last time uh, dr narendra also suggested one of the things we can look at so far we are emphasizing only on giving loan to msmes now the large corporates can think about investing in equity in msme suppliers msme dealers and that is the way we can create a very robust msme system going forward then i have an observations on valuation we are talking about the valuation one thing we, we should remember the value of a enterprise depends on who is going to buy i'll give a simple example you see companies like microsoft oracle sap and all these people they have something called technology architecture so they don't have all the technologies which are required to run their business so many a times what they do they buy the technologies all companies so if you take the history of uh, mergers and acquisitions by these large it giants you will find they are buying companies for 10 million dollar 20 million dollar 30 million dollar whereas they are, these are trillion dollar companies so you must be wondering why they buy a small company i tell you when a small company is very small their footprint is very very small they are uh, they are available only in usa when they become part of a uh, Uh, that is why you know facebook paid i think 50 billion dollars to whatsapp so once they become a part of a large system then this technology can be taken to 150 countries in the world so what is 10 million in the hands of uh, 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 msme when it comes to microsoft actually its value is 1 billion dollar 100 times more so this is one of the concepts which you have to look at while looking at valuation so the same thing what we saw in terms of a uh, uh, steel you are thinking that uh, these companies are paying very high price for steel steel companies but fortunately after they acquired these companies steel prices went up so it was a margin accretive for them so that is what i wanted to say as far as msmes are concerned i don't so, know no kannan ji what they are suggesting if not uh, can we have a different uh, santosh mallar or can react can we have a different uh, standards for msme as compared to large corporate that is the one uh, no that is a uh, reasonable 
and yeah. also the another thing uh, that uh, caro and all that up uh, norms then no? usko bhi thoda uniform karna sakta hai that i think there is a some uh, so three to four question they have asked so that question they are uh, expecting so uh, before manoj ji abhi hum uh, baad mein i am going to take a leave i have got some other program so yeah, one Narendra, area Narendra. one area i am touching yeah, is uh, both of us my no no both of us myself Let's and kannan yeah. we are going away from valuation the rbi recently has uh, no made a uh, that credit policy yesterday so all were expecting uh, that uh, there will be status quo as per that they have maintained the status quo both the repo rate and reverse repo rate and the what you call other uh, marginal standing facility rate but uh, uh, there are uh, still concerns on because i am giving only headlines concerns on inflation the international oil prices being high some of the raw material internationally also like steel and other uh, materials and coal particularly all have become scarce due to the china factor so all these prices uh, may have an impact on india but uh, monsoon and carif uh, rabi crop and all could be fairly better so when you of that they are uh, overall estimating the inflation at the 5.3 or 5.2 i think that is the figure they are average for the full year but uh, again next year also the first quarter the expectation is slightly higher so in the after 2020 until uh, that no they were uh, that 4% uh, what was the uh, targeted inflation uh, there is a 200 basis up or down you can uh, means there is a plus or minus but uh, it has now yesterday the one of the deputy governor mentioning that in the current uh, scenario uh, we must be able to maintain within that maximum of 6 that itself should be appreciated because the last year up to last year it is a, again uh, reasonably 6 or plus but this year is expected below 6 so that is the one thing and uh, the liquidity level in the industry or overall it has gone to around 13 lakh crores overall around 9 to 10 lakh crores and other uh, when you take effective liquidity and that's why in the beginning last year uh, last policy i think reserve bank introduced called uh, government securities purchase program and they intended that time maybe uh, 1 lakh 20000 crores and later uh, maybe higher that was the thing they intended so when you in- introduce government securities purchase program means you purchase the such of the government securities and release the liquidity so the even after the last covid also there on 3 crores of additional liquidity has taken into the system but apart from the bank resource mobilization and overall last year you are aware during the 2008 uh, 20 rbs uh, infused around 12 lakh crores of liquidity now in the current scenario rbi has felt uh, indirectly of course they say we are going to continue with the accommodative policy and we have so many tools to see that liquidity what level needed we will maintain and uh, that uh, if you are to do the operation twist or uh, even government security purchase program or uh, even uh, open market operation we will uh, quite will do it but now they have announced uh, that uh, variable uh, uh, what do you call uh, rate of interest uh, that repo earlier uh, that was last time 14 days this time also 14 days but the quantity they have increased so by december this quantity will go to 6 lakh crores so that uh, now also that they may introduce another 28 days 14 days to 28 days now what it means means that much liquidity they will other than the bank facing the money in the reverse repo for which they get 3.35 this long term the rbi will also take out the money 14 days 28 days so what the yesterday i saw one interview that uh, that on the longer term reserve bank gets a fair amount of control on the liquidity but on the what are banks keep that is uh, their discretion that uh, whenever they find the daily you no know, now 8 8 and half lakh crores are being and this year the government uh, utilization of fiscal deficit is low less and uh, their uh, direct tax indirect taxes are also in the buoyancy so the government has given the this half year also what is their uh, uh, proposed borrowing and they are not likely to 
go any access to the borrowing program they will be restricting it to 12 lakh crores maybe even less also so if the same tempo of profit and profitability and the corporate taxation or individual taxation all that and also the gst 1.117 lakh crores which is likely to go up this is the, the busy season and this festival the government will get lot of money so in the on that point there is no pressure on the market and rbi can uh, continuously manage that well uh, as compared to the earlier period earlier period to make that always uh, that government uh, borrowing program easier uh, the government rbi has also during the covid because of the growth factor so growth versus inflation and also government borrowing the government, rbi has pumped in money now the credit growth per se is hardly 6 6.5% and it may uh, best of the situation it may go up to 10% that is the uh, some of the banks you know be to the uh, during this period like you know the your housing loan lot of uh, loan will be now even during the best season and but the corporate per se are not much borrowing hardly even uh, it is negative or maybe up to 1% so uh, they are uh, going for the market related to bond and other uh, ipo and equity and all and they are they are flush with the funds and they have some of them have paid back the money so in the in this scenario the maintaining high liquidity per se uh, in the system may lead to further inflation so but the rbi will not uh, formally say that we have started the reversal of the earlier uh, high liquidity in the system but uh, in a way the control on the liquidity which has to be done so as to say that that related the inflation don't go further the inflation uh, will be uh, managed in such a way that it is much below the 6% uh, that uh, upper level of target so that's where they have started but the market uh, feels that is a indirectly of course rbi governor gave a quite a lot of reason to feel, uh, uh, again say that we are uh, uh, still accommodative we are also likely to see liquidity in that there is nothing to prove that we have started reversal and our policy goes by the local uh, requirements and local uh, uh, situation and we are not like you know us fed has said the inflation has started going up so the us may uh, that their purchase quantitative easing and all that they may uh, uh, stop and uh, they may also increase the rates by december or by that there may be interest rate increase but indian contest the slowly slowly the reverse repo will uh, get higher up and higher up that is already yesterday one of the that uh, arr went up to 3.90 so again the 3.35 and rbi accepted that uh, around 4.5 lakh crores so ideally uh, the reverse repo rate cannot be a reference rate reference rate is the repo rate 4% but uh, what used to happen that the reverse repo rate uh, and below that also uh, of course uh, sanju will be knowing it yeah. was going at a lower rate now that being the case rbi has started and uh, maybe the reversal or what you call interest rate increase may come in the 2022 only some people say by december but i don't think but the reverse repo rate only may be announced upwards and the short term rates also are now getting into the nearer to the repo rate and the long term uh, yield yesterday has slightly uh, uh, what it call uh, 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 it has gone up but uh, uh, with the further thing i think it, you cannot you will not be doing that it will go more uh, harder and uh, other side uh, the rupee rate all of you are aware because of the uh, the overall situation that has also moved to near to the 75 with this uh, manoj ji hamara aaj ka kaam to khatam ho gaya are good and very interesting <laughs> insights on yield liquidity uh, rbi policy uh, nfra latest developments valuation standard santosh uh, can we have the uh, demystification for nfra on the screen santosh yeah let's have yeah. a consultation paper on the screen what's happening abroad what is happening on msme listed players unlisted players various criteria the world is doing what is the last date for the consultation paper and everybody knows i see i want to make a presentation to the nfra also uh, to work together so maximum people uh, send their group to icai also
can you come and explain? Yeah, so Manoj ji, what I'll do is uh, I also have to, you know, uh, get into another Zoom call at 1.30. So I'll try to keep it quick. But basically, uh, this uh, consultation paper which uh, you're referring to, it is basically seeking views from constituents, as Narendra ji rightly said, to abolish... Uh, uh, you know, statutory audit in lines with uh, GST and uh, tax audit uh, for small companies. They haven't yet defined what is uh, small companies and that is in fact one of the questions that they have sought uh, the views from uh, the constituents. Uh, what they have done is they have raised four questions. The last day. Can you share uh, the consultation paper on the screen? Can? Yeah, I'm just trying to uh, find a consultation paper in my laptop. So meanwhile, yeah. I'll just speak up. Yes, yes, certainly. So uh, what they have tried to do is they have uh, uh, made the case based on the fact that uh, they have uh, pulled up some statistics from the MCA filing. Uh, um, and they have analyzed the number of, uh, uh, you know, the number of uh, companies that we have in India, registered companies who file their annual returns, uh, and what is the audit fees on an average, what is the turnover, etc. And they have tried to stratify these companies into various uh, categories based on turnover, based on uh, indebtedness, and based on uh, employee strength. And uh, they have uh, proposed that, I mean, the question that they have uh, really sought is whether small companies uh, are required to basically uh, have the statutory audit because uh, uh, if there is no indebtedness, if the turnover is very low, then there is no sense of having a statutory audit. So let me just try to share this screen. So as you rightly said, internationally they have benchmarked it with the situation abroad. And uh, we all know that in the US, uh, non-listed companies with uh, certain, uh, you know, uh, which are below certain size limits, uh, as a matter of fact, do not require uh, uh, statutory audits. And uh, in fact, most of the uh, subsidiaries of Indian companies uh, face the issue that, you know, there is no statutory audit required there. So how do you, so, you know, as a requirement under the Indian uh, listing uh, obligations, LOD, uh, oh, is my screen visible now? Yeah, yeah, yeah visible? excellent, excellent. So, uh, yeah, so what I was referring to is they have done some benchmarking with uh, some of the countries abroad, some of the jurisdictions abroad, including the US, Singapore, European, European etc. Let me just get to that page. How many pages is the consultation paper and what is the large day for giving the views? Uh, it spans into 45 pages. Last date is uh, 8th, uh, is 10th of uh, November. That's tomorrow. Uh, night, uh, November. Next month. Next month. Next month. Next month. Next month. Next month. Yeah. Consultation. So, uh, I'll just, yeah, the global jurisdiction. So, they have analyzed the requirements, the directive in uh, the European Union where basically small undertakings uh, are not covered under the audit obligations. Small undertakings, the thresholds have been defined by, by individual uh, members of the European Union, individual countries. So they have given an annexure which lays out, you know, what are the thresholds of each country, balance sheet, total turnover or average number of uh, employees. Uh, then in United Kingdom, they have uh, small companies are exempt from audit and the criteria for exemption is on the basis of satisfying two or out of three uh, thresholds on the basis of total turnover or number of employees. So there are certain thresholds which you can see on screen. Singapore, uh, small companies. Page number. 
Fifteen. Very interesting. Yeah. Very yes. deep dive they have done. Lot of study. Lot of insight. Singapore small companies are exempt from audit, uh, and the criteria uh, for exemption on uh, the basis of satisfying two out of three thresholds. That is based on balance sheet, total turnover, and number of employees. So the thresholds again are on your screen. Revenue of uh, US uh, Singapore dollar ten million. Total assets of Singapore dollar ten million. Number of employees of fifty. Australia again, likewise. You know you have uh, two out of the three thresholds: revenue, total assets, and number of uh, employees. I mean, most of these companies do have uh, you know uh, uh, a common framework in terms of the exemption. Uh, U.S. of course, uh, there is a model business corporation act, uh, which uh, recommended that you know uh, certain companies, small companies, do not uh, require a statutory audit. So non-listed companies, uh, which are regulated and under that act, uh, do not require uh, to get themselves audit audited. Uh, Japan again, only certain large companies must be audited by an independent CPA. This requirements uh, are uh, laid down in the, the, the rules. There is also a PI or a public interest entity concept uh, in which uh, audit is required. So banks, insurance companies, etc., need to get themselves audited. But otherwise, for small companies, audit is not required. So. Basically, Nefra in this paper has uh, done some kind of benchmarking with uh, international, uh, com- uh, you know, uh, jurisdictions uh, out, uh, outside India, and they have, uh, you know, set the ball rolling in terms of whether or a statutory audit is indeed a, a requirement in India for small companies. So these are the four uh, questions, Manojji, that you can see on screen. Do you think the MSMEs, depending on upon some criteria and threshold, should be exempted from the mandatory statutory audit under Companies Act 2030. Uh, second question is: Do you think the requirement of a separate set of auditing standards for MSMEs, as it exists uh, for accounting standards? And then, thirdly, the cost of conducting audit should be prescribed. So, whether there should be a minimum fee that should be prescribed that small entities should uh, you know pay to the auditors and lastly do you think the current exemption thresholds of caro icfr statutory audit applicability need to be standardized and made uniform so these are the four questions that uh, the uh, nefra has sought views on very very important very simple uh, in fact, we wonder if all the institutes can also come out with regular consultation paper and involve all stakeholders besides the professional uh, and the members. Because there are many chartered accountants, people say over 3 lakh 25,000 chartered accountants. Uh, how many are members? How many pay fees because of pandemic? How many remaining uh, people are saying hardly anybody could pay the fees due to various issues? Uh, in the pandemic, certain date has been extended. Whether can they participate in the consultation paper? Will there be a new consultation paper by the institute? It's very important and very simple question. Uh, so people can participate. What is the thought process uh, of uh, all participants in this? Uh, we have said it's a gradual process. There should be involvement of all the stakeholders. And we should not be left behind the world also. Other countries, uh, they have been doing it. Now it's India's uh, turn at the forefront. So we should not only be uh, on par with them, but much ahead than the other country. In terms of ease of doing business and involvement of all stakeholders in consultation. There has been an article in business line the office bearers of the institutes have invited uh, comments uh, from their members. So uh, they should get maximum comments. There are very few people who are sending emails to the institute. 
so it's only when communication comes they can combine and interact and whether there are interactive zoom meetings uh, the office bearers or the institute can do with experts like us who are ready to contribute that is very very vital so mutually along with all regulators mca sebi rbi santosh even rbi needs to have his own uh, uh, regulations right for msme what is the threshold they would like to have even rbi should get the give the views on that threshold they would like to have not only for its uh, nbfcs uh, and but also for the msme because that's a very yeah. important area whether it should be 10 crores the turnover limit or it should be 50 crore asset limit or no, it should as, be number of employees as right absolutely so as mr kannan also described that one of the stakeholders for statutory audit or otherwise uh, for msmes would be the banks because primarily if you look at the small companies uh, why do you set up a company in first place place right you can have a proprietary concern you can have a uh, llp generally people uh, uh, get get themselves corporatized and incorporate a private limited company to get loans to get bank loans because that's easier uh, or to get licenses you know there can be some uh, uh regulatory requirements where it has to be allocated only to a company now that is where i think the government all the regulators need to holistically look at it including the rbi because the banks would be a, a, a major stakeholders in this because if statutory audit is uh, done away with then what are the other checks and balances that you would have of course as mr kanan mentioned that as you embrace technologies and transactions become more and more digital uh, probably yes there is a case for uh, doing away with the uh, statutory audit for small companies but the question the um, the the question is uh, basically in our tier 2 tier 3 cities is you know our transactions really that digitalized or are you know things happening on a uh, cashless basis uh, uh, to that extent that you do away with uh, statutory audits that's that's perhaps what uh, you know the regulators need to uh, look into yeah i i am of the view uh, there are only 11 lakh like, uh, companies registered in india today and of course which are company has been registered it comes under companies act 2013 irrespective of the size uh, uh like uh, it was mentioned by mr santosh whenever you go to a regulatory authority they will always ask for a, a kind of statutory audit which gives them comfort even for licensing even for getting a loan and uh, plus what we are saying we want all these all companies to get integrated with the economy that is what we want so on the one side we talk about formalization of the economy on the other side we are talking about uh, let, let them not uh, uh, follow formal procedures so these are conflicting objectives according to me and if we have one crore companies i agree yes it will be very difficult but uh, we have only 11 lakh like companies i don't know so the number of auditors we have as of today certainly they can cover level like companies uh, only thing like it was mentioned in mr santosh we can prescribe the audit fees what i mentioned when i said digitization uh, since uh, now everything is being digitized even doing a statutory audit for a small company with the minimum number of transactions it would be much easier for auditors to complete that is uh, what i meant so uh, i strongly feel that uh, since we don't have too many uh, companies in india and we have enough chartered accountants and plus we want to go in a formal way formalization of the economy uh, the suggestion that they don't require such to audit as we really looked into and plus we are all aware sebi has got mandates uh companies above 5 crore profit you do csr companies above 1000 crore 
so like that there are conditions by which they you have different uh, terms for these companies so what we can do for these companies let statutory audit be there but some of the other provisions relating to company act companies act there could be relaxations for these small companies that is my excellent insight mr kannan any thoughts uh, from any other uh, panelist participant we have got a huge number of speakers here today everybody is welcome to share mr abhishek you are here so manoj ji what i feel is uh, benchmarking it with some of these international countries may not necessarily be a good idea because we know that you know the situation on ground in india is quite different to let's say a singapore or a mm. australia because uh, if you look at the reality in some of the tier 2 tier 3 cities cash transactions still take place right it still dominates the business so uh, there has to be some sense of uh, uh, you know some sense of uh, uh, checks of balance so if statutory audit is not as mr kannan also said that you know if there is no statutory audit then what are the checks and balances in place so far as the tax or so far as the banks are concerned uh, mr mano you also asked me to talk about this monetary policy i have just a few observations yeah thanks thanks mr kannan before that i would like to have archana to share some thoughts archana Achana, you are here with us. You have deep insights in a standard. Achana, doctor is there. Doctor. Yeah, until then, until doctor. Achana comes, yeah, Mr. Kanan, carry on, carry on. Your talk, yeah. the latest development. Yeah, yeah. This monetary policy, of course, it was uh, uh, very well explained by Dr. Narendra. you know on the last uh, eight uh, times uh, the rbi passed yeah they have not done anything but they now indicated that the interest rates are likely to go up like uh, dr narendra also said yesterday the variable uh, rate auction which was done instead of 3.35 actually the rate has gone up to 3.85 why the interest rate should go up i'll tell you you know if uh, us starts increasing the rate all these capital flows across the world they depend on interest rates in a country so if you find that the interest rates in us rise the model happen some of the funds uh, which will come through fpis they'll start going back yeah, so yeah. so there is a need for yeah. india to give a interest rate which is competitive it all have any bank so i think that is the logic behind why rbi was saying that uh, interest rates So one more thing what is what is the what is the role of rbi and as uh, governor has clearly explained it is inflation targeting now it is between 4 to 6 earlier they used to have a single rate and 4 5 years ago they moved to a, a range of 4 to 6% so now they are very comfortable that it will be between 4 to 6% and one more thing in the last 8 uh, 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 meetings. What we found, actually, the policies brought by RBI did not have any any effect on liquidity. Actually, uh, Governor himself has admitted that every week there is an addition of fifty thousand crores of liquidity which is coming into the system. So, uh, so what, when the RBI policy will be very effective? Only when the capital flows. are sensitive to the policies so right now the policy which is going to be more effective will be a fiscal policy i am very happy that the central government uh, i think till the month of september all the departments in central government they have not spent the money which was which were allocated to them now government is seeing that there is a good uh, collection of a uh, tax and good movement in uh, gst and there is a requirement for borrowing will be as per their expectation in the beginning of the year now uh, now government also will not borrow too much from the market 
they are going to get 2 to 1 of uh, lakh crores only from small savings so now what is going to push india in terms of growth will be the expenditure by government departments as budgeted second what we are seeing all indicators which are coming now in fact today most of you must have seen uh, yesterday and today the size of the times of uh, india paper the advertisements itself are about 40 pages which means that there is a lot of uh, momentum which is coming to consumer markets to real estate markets and uh, the people who are not spending money all this time they started looking at spending money so all this is a, a good indicator and according to me the monetary policy will not be effective even for another six months only only when we see that uh, U.S. government, uh, U.S. Treasury is going to increase the rates. Already, as you are all aware, ten-year Treasury uh, uh, rates have gone up to 1.85 percent now, and the people expect that it will uh, harden further. In which case, obviously, then the next meeting I expect RBI to uh, people are expecting that RBI may not increase rates. Already, they have done increasing the rates by way of introducing this variable rate repo. Uh, already yesterday in the auction which was held, the rates have gone up. Similarly, uh, the 10-year rate also in the auction yesterday, I think it was up by 5 basis points or 10 basis points. So what you'll see by the next meeting, you'll find at least 50 to 100 basis points going up. Now, I sense that going forward, interest rates are likely to go up in India. That is bound to happen. Uh, as far as inflation, I am sure it is all due to supply constraints and slowly, slowly the supply constraints will be removed because we are getting into normal mode in most of the states. And today, I think uh, Pune uh, Puna University has announced that they can open the colleges and the departments. So now you'll see slowly everybody getting into normal. I think in the last meeting we discussed, now instead of it will be called as a pandemic, it will be treated as an endemic and uh, people are talking about giving the third dose to people who are uh, the BMC and the doctors, giving them a third dose. So that is what is being talked about. Now, we started treating this as an endemic. I hope that uh, we will not have the third wave and uh, we, all, we all will pray for a uh, faster recovery. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Kanan. Arjuna, you are there? Archana? Yeah. Archana, your thoughts on what uh, other uh, co experts uh, on the panel have said? And you have been a member of the Audit and Accounts Board also, an award winner at ICI with rich experience. Your thoughts, Archana? And your presentation also, you can share the screen with your deep dive slide as a part of the series. Achana? Sorry, I wasn't mute. Yeah, uh, thank you for this opportunity, Manoji. Uh, yeah, I would like to share my thoughts on the uh, new proposed uh, regulation, um, you know, doing away with audit for small companies. So, uh, like two, two points I would like to express. Uh, one thing is, um, as a banker, uh, it remains to be seen how the um, requirements of the banks will be met uh, with this particular uh, change proposed uh, because there are uh, at the nitty gritty level at the uh, small business banking or the loans level um, there would be lots of requirements from the bank sides that they would need the audited financial uh, results of each company okay so uh, it remains to be seen how that requirements are met. Uh, and there, there is also a requirement with regard to yearly renewals of the, uh, you know, uh, of the loan accounts for the overdrafts and the cash credits. Uh, uh, how, how the government is able to meet with the bankers' requirements yeah, for yeah. this? And what would be the sanctity uh, of yeah. such statements if the audit is done away with? Uh, that is the point which I would like to express. 
from the ca of from the uh, from the perspective of the uh, ca fraternity i think uh, uh, it is more for the practicing chartered accountants you know uh, as to how it could impact and what kind of impact it would have on their revenue so that remains to be seen from the ca fraternity side so this is a limited point that i would like to make manoj ji yeah thanks uh, yeah and everybody Thank is looking forward to a presentation series you are doing we know that your slides are ready uh, hopefully you are plan to do in the next uh, weekend saturday yeah, yeah. right we we'll look forward to that uh, sanjeev a rich experience with deloitte you are there sanjeev uh yeah yeah sanjeev uh, your thoughts on nfra consultation paper you got rich experience globally and uh, locally also with deloitte uh, big four your thoughts on nfra consultation paper frankly uh, your frank thoughts as usual the way you articulate now uh, what i would say manoj ke uh, small and medium practitioners will be affected definitely because audit if it is now we cannot compare ourselves with other countries other countries that the situation is different here so our brothers now for me i am not talking about me uh, but uh, for the coming uh, you know because i have already uh, competed many years but uh, now very few will enter the profession that is the trend and uh, it will lose it so uh, and how can you say okay, uh, those uh, our entrepreneurs will not be hiding the turnover if the turnover limit is uh, so they will try to show that turnover minimum so that they are not the work any thoughts about the turnover limit it should be 250 crores 200 crores 500 crores or 50 crores or asset limit or net worth limit sanjeev okay. you have got rich deloitte experience you been part of big floor and you know ease of doing business and you know the stakeholders expectation and the global standard and global best practices uh, it's just a thought it can but uh, audit yani minimum requirement caro and all those points may not be covered but some that certification uh, so that uh, what they remain in ms and mean to remain in ms and they will have to have the turnover limit is there so whether they are actually in that limit so that is what so msb is uh, could be extended but certification should be done wherever required by msm right yes or wherever required by bankers very good insight uh, dr ganatra excellent presentation okay. excellent discussion your thought on all this and you can also add your views on the rbi monetary policy yesterday yeah i i have absolutely nothing to say about rbi monetary policy uh, apart from what narendra ji and what kanan ji said i fully agree i am waiting for the rates to go up and the money has to flow out because the us is going to now taper off so that's nothing beyond that can be said uh, yeah um, uh, the inflation may now be tamed having been you know in a gallop rate the recent times nothing beyond that but coming to this audit i have only two points to make you know these are in fact i am now going to go through it and i am going to respond to that uh, i very much welcome you know this idea of uh, stratifying and taking some companies off the audit why i am telling you see when you when these are being taken off the audit doesn't mean that they won't have credible accounts it will be for them to have credibility if they say this is my uh, you know stock value it will be his value he cannot shoot from the shoulder of somebody else okay some unscrupulous people also cannot you know uh, put a gun point at the temple of the guy and say that look you give me this much money otherwise i am going to give you an adverse uh, wonderful report that is what report. happening yes no. this is what happening in the ground but you have nailed it yeah absolutely now if i am a lender which i have been for 20 and a half years i would not put my team to do an audit and come up see when there is an acquisition by the acquirer he doesn't bank there is no credibility of the financial statements today so when i am going to you know expose myself financially i am going to ask him to give me the you know 
tally or sap i'll go through the day book i'll do my own full fledged transaction audit and modify his accounts as simple as that and i'll do my transaction so the, the, you know moment it becomes self regulation uh, in this case as long as you know, he is keeping doing it on his own with his own capital he is comfortable right the tax authorities with their artificial intelligence would be able to figure out you know uh, what transactions they are running okay they, now everything is linked and everything they can figure out i i'm not saying that there will be no gaming there can still be gaming there can be gaming and there is gaming with auditors and without auditors as well but if some people are taken off they will have to be careful about the figures that say i often say that you know the bank should do away with you know uh, st- uh, this uh, stock certification instead ask a direct a board of directors certified statement about the stocks etc they will get discipline otherwise what the audit firm will do is take a management declaration and put the figures so overall it's a good idea i think this is my first impression i am going to further study it uh, it's a good idea and i'm absolutely certain that having come up with this paper they will now go to the next step and with that yes see if fraternity will have some less work to do but they will have quality more work to do one of course they will still maintain uh, the accounts of many people because many small people do not have their own you know uh, people uh, account departments they will still be able to do it and then they will be getting into more into you know finance aspects so that's where it is i'm sure it's very boring to do compliance as compliance as compliance so it could be more of financial analysis as well. and as i said i'm just repeating banks will do their own audits and they will be able to make their decision there will be no problem rajendra ji sorry to interrupt but what i have to say ca doesn't become a ca for becoming an accountant well service i am talking of service he is a chartered accountant he has yeah. some statutory yeah he can, has a statutory authority he can sign we will be concentrating on consultancy part and uh, companies like and all those things we will be co- uh, concentrating on all those things but audits you know should not be done away with uh, whatever you are saying i am not but then that is what my thoughts are okay. audit should not be done there will See, be a uh, check. there will be a check there will be a control that management will not try to uh, manipulate or uh, i i understand i understand your view point absolutely clearly uh, my point is that when the credibility of audit will rise to a substantially high level at that point of time even small fellows will go for audit right now for any serious transaction there has got to be a, a an audit uh, accounting due diligence that's what is happening like you know the this uh, uh, krishna pallettu and uh, paul healy book obviously the uh, accounts are far more credible than normally what we are seeing here so probably that will happen there are pros and cons there are you know uh, points for and for points against it is not uh, open and shut matter it has both the uh, you know con- components very important point uh, uh, quality of audit needs to be improved they are c- coming out with now audit quality councils also new standards uh, the vice chairman of the board uh, durgesh kapra shared with us earlier and he said we are second in the world to come out with uh, uh, quality uh, and uh, it is still not mandatory we wonder when the when they will make ma- it ma- mandatory and make it publicized for members come to know so far quality has been very very poor as is seen by the inspection and uh, peer reviews which are uploaded on the regulator website many many companies they are coming out on a regular basis practically every week some updates are there sanjeev can you put your video on please sanjeev yeah some point raised by sanjeev was sanjeev of course would like to have good quality but he is talking about employment opportunities you know service opportunities for some members maybe whether they need to upgrade their skills 
that is very very important more training for them that is very very important so they can do some value added work also there are so many opportunities in value added as we have seen uh, also in industry in opportunity in digital as mr kannan uh, has shared right sanjeev agree there your thoughts on improvement in quality it, you you did uh, lots of training and you are still learning every day right participating in ten tank meeting so quality needs to be improved and opportunities come automatically and also bankers should get opportunity bankers can also request for audit right anyone so let the higher threshold be there yes yes in yes. yes. those special yes. audits anuj ji there those special audits will become the in thing yes. so that will that will be wonderful yeah sanjay yes. your thoughts yes. on special audits and request by bankers yes and then uh, one more thing that since uh, most of them are going for computerization in that case systems audit should be made uh, compulsory okay. recently a good thing has been done that you know the audit trail has be, be, been made compulsory so that is uh, you know uh, ensured that no banky banky will happen okay wonderful and with this uh, a final concluding remarks by sanjeev and uh, dr rajendra then we can close the session and the yeah. interaction ah uh, manoj ji yes, what sir. i was telling yeah, that Narendra, the yeah. audit per se has not helped the bank uh, in terms of any recovery <laughs> or anything exactly you had the name and yes ye sab hai na aapke liye to that is a professional work all that uh, there can be so many other work to be done by the uh, auditor for msme that is not the audit itself is not the ultimate there are so many other work and uh, today even uh, prepack uh, for msme there is a pre work to be done by the auditor uh, chartered accountant for making them base resolution plan so many other things they can help so but uh, we what we have found that if there are other means by which you can arrive at the data so say today for may not be 250 crores even at a smaller level why the bank should also insist or the financer should say isko audit karke lagao तो वो क्या होता है वो ऑडिट है ना उसके लिए ऑडिट उसको जरूरत नहीं तो भी वो कुछ से साइन करके लेके आएगा तो इफ सिमिलरली इफ इज ऑलरेडी हैविंग बैंक अकाउंट एंड इवन इफ यू हैव नॉट अवेल द लिमिट बाय गोइंग थ्रू द बैंकिंग अकाउंट टुडे एंड विद अदर सिविल एंड अदर डेटा वी कैन अराइव एट व्हाट इज दिस लेवल ऑफ एंड यू नो ऑल द एनबीएफसी दे डोंट डिले यूर रिलाई ऑन यूर ऑडिटेड रिजल्ट दे आर दैट what counseling and what discussion they do and also collect a lot of uh, uh, other information and uh, they do the information uh, no uh, uh, analytics and then arrive at this is the likely cash flow this is the uh, mismatch in the cash flow and for this mismatch working capital uh, i would give maybe even uh, od also not necessarily with that and they see that uh, with the security level coverage and they see that these okay. account that's where that the nbfc and the new digital lending they say their msme portfolio are performing better what so has, what this suggestion saying. is a good suggestion but it will uh, take time to evolve and, and as uh, rajendra said the bank has its own mean to get the whatever audit or whatever certification be done and uh, that time also they can utilize the service of chartered accountant okay aap or okay. as he said our their own team can go and interact and find out all the details so whether you like it or not some of the changes in the yeah. regulatory thing will be coming that will be positive in middle east and all those wonderful insight narendra you are you are hit the nail on the head very very valid yeah. point each and every point is really valid manoj let me sir yeah yeah uh, in middle east and all i was in muscat and there the banks would freeze the accounts if their accounts are not audited in the time by 30th april also if that is what they have 31st december as year ending and four months time they had to get their accounts audited although that was 10 years back but uh, that is what so saying that bank should not insist on audited accounts i would not agree with that wo sanju ji udhar ka udhar ka rule hai to unhone to follow karenge na ये तो हम वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट रूल इट सेल्फ गेटिंग चेंज वेर इज द क्वेश्चन ऑफ बैंक फ्रीजिंग बैंक विल फ्रीज इफ देयर इज अ डाइवर्शन ऑफ फंड ओनली बैंक्स आर आल्सो सैंक्शनिंग द लोन्स 
What I mean is, uh, banks are not for uh, banks are not for promoting auditors. That is not the bank work. Hence, ninety is I was doing bank branch audit also, and then <laughs> we were partners, and we came to know that the loans were sanctioned just like that, and we were told something which you will not. It is not pleasant to hear, and uh, so that is what. So banks are also responsible. Why auditors are quality is not good. That is the Subject thing. Audit quality will be good, provided there is cooperation from the management side also. Uh, again, important point uh, on uh, management, promoter quality, and ethics is very important. Ethics is the first thing which any good banker looks in sanctioning loan. But the quality of the uh, uh, audit or review or contribution by the person certifying is very important. You have seen. Uh, We had a chartered accountant from Kalba Devi appointed by Reliance Group, and without receiving going to the office, carry rubber stamp and do signatures and write off over two thousand crores in subsidiary. So, so many insights. A strict vigilance is required. Vigilance is the price of freedom, and uh, many council members are participating, interacting, loving the interactive session. Really wonderful. Really? Manoj ji, just one point. Can I make? Yeah, sure. Most welcome. We want maximum points before uh, the final. Yeah, uh, uh, just time of, just yeah. just want to put forth one point with regard to the debate uh, on whether audit is required or not. Put your video uh, on, please. Put your video on. Yeah. So um, yeah, just one more point I want to make is uh, see when the yes. auditor signs yes, a yes, certificate yes, or signs the. Final close up. Yeah, please come. yeah so the auditor is responsible for those statements which he is signing okay in case of any fraud or uh, you know non recovery due to diversion of funds sipin of sipining of funds the auditor is equally responsible and uh, he is also liable under the companies act uh, under section 477 uh, under the definition of fraud so uh, you know that if the auditor is not if the statements are not audited then there is no question of any liability there is no one to certify that whatever is presented is whether it is true or correct or not there may be cases yes as you were saying that auditors in kalba devi are just putting the rubber stamp but then they are also liable so the bank or the authorities can always pull up these people uh, if it is found that uh, the companies that they are auditing are siphoning of the funds that is the limited view i would like to uh, put forth Excellent insight, Archana. Section 477A of Indian Penal Code is very, very clear. It's Indian Penal Code, criminal action. So much wrong things are happening. Enforcement. Now, just now, they have started increasing. We have seen the great work being done for the Narcotic Control Board on uh, Cordela Cruz. What's happening? Some conferences will be held on Cord Cordela Cruz. You will see many, many professionals uh, and the uh, council members too. If it is held, right? Uh, Sanjay Pandey, are you back, Mr. Sanjay Pandey? Pandey, yes, you are coming back. Yeah, yeah. Some yeah. final thoughts from you on yes, uh, on various points, uh, including this uh, critical uh, vital issue on uh, audits and also on the, your take on RBI policy latest. Okay, RBI has recently come out. I think your video on. Video video on. Okay. yeah yes so rbi has come out with two three very interesting policies recently one is that uh, sale to arc they have opened the uh, market for fraudulent assets also asset declared as fraud earlier they were not saleable so now rbi has permitted uh, even uh, fraud assets that was one of the recommendation uh, i think we made that uh, why the lender should have a double whammy once he has suffered due to a fraud and then he cannot sell also. i think rbi has uh, got the point and uh, they have uh, changed the policy second i think uh, is uh, that arcs are now going to face competition from other buyers also because in another policy of transfer of loans uh, rbi has opened the market for even corporates and uh, other entities they can also participate in uh, buying of loans corporate loans, including uh, they opened the market for stress assets also so as we bankers know that earlier selling a loan was very difficult because there used to be very stringent guidelines 
but now rbi is trying to open uh, this window so we now banks can sell their loans including stress loans to other than uh, other than arcs also apart from banks so i think these two are very very interesting uh, developments so this will open the market for both uh, the loans and the stress loans which will uh, kind of create a price discovery so far we don't know that if i have given a loan say 3 years back what is the value of my loan so then market can now decide whether that loan is in a premium or a discount today and second thing it will open the flood gates for banks to exit some uh, areas where they are not focused there will be more uh, syndication of loans and then there will be more uh, i think uh, transaction in uh, loans which will help smaller banks in acquiring loans even with records without records with credit risk without credit risk all these options are available so i think these two are important uh, elements and audit i didn't understand the question can you repeat the quality of audit uh, dr ganatra just mentioned so we can have a very important view yeah yeah, yeah I, i didn't hear mr ganatra so if you can repeat the yeah ganatra and also or they are putting gun point and making people uh, uh, demand before they sign Sa- Sa- sanjeev ji i i when i you know said hello i i couldn't you know communicate with you oh, okay just, okay sorry turned a bit slow okay uh-huh. what okay. i had said what i had said was you know uh, uh-huh. there's a need for the credibility of the audit to uh, go up substantially there is a need uh, yeah. for any big transaction in mergers acquisition or uh, investment or anything there is always a, an accounting due diligence uh, comes nobody gives a damn to the uh, audited accounts so that's a fact of life now yeah. you know if as, as long as an msme is putting his own money he is going to keep account where is the need for him to get it audited okay now if certain you know requirements for certain license or etc etc they seek audit if the very audit uh, if they seek audit the special audit can be done for them similarly the banks i don't think the banks have been too happy about stock audit etc because this stock is a specialized activity you know and an auditor cannot really value that he has to take management declaration and do it in fact sometimes it is used, used to keep a gun point and say that okay you give so much you know donation to some entity or i am going to give you false support this is this is what happens no such thing will happen he will um, and and if the bank wants to fund any entity which is not audited it will do a special audit by its own chartered accountants employees or its audit firm so what i am saying is that it's a very good paper in fact santosh ji uh, good thanks for highlighting i had missed it out i was hearing about it but i was not downloading now i'll go download go through it yeah. i feel it's a very good yeah. and finally archana ji was mentioning about you know the penalties for non compliance now what happens an auditor only looks at the vouchers whether voucher is a junk okay. or not so therefore an auditor cannot really figure out the legal reality oh and you must listen to the video of the cfo of enron now he has mentioned you know the loopholes were the leverage for do illegal things legal participant activities is you know if it's taken off the cs will have you know still enough to do in the hands you will not have to bank on very routine kind of an one second yeah sanction audit as the banks require जीएसटी <laughs> statement that i audited balance sheet as is our experience with the balance sheet but 
coming back to the statutory audit i think uh, this audit have been a source of lot of npl lot of problem because of the what is not said in the statement audit what is remain unsaid and with a disclaimer of course so i think in that respect uh, we should devise or bank should devise some kind of a 360 degree audit of this company so what auditor is doing sitting in a corporate for 10 days and giving a report without going into details and then giving the report with disclaimers which is of a limited help to any of the analyst so why not assign a auditor one particular corporate let them audit this company round the clock like for 360 days let them charge a higher fees but they will be monitoring the market movement of their equity they'll be monitoring the movement movement of stocks movement of receivables then their holdings asset movement everything and when they come out with a report every year that will be much more reliable than a report given by a statutory auditor so i think banks are gradually moving in that direction and then we are also applying lot of artificial intelligence now because lot of data is thrown up by a account only thing is that it is a matter of consolidating consolidating the data from various sources like there are 15 members bank in a consortium but each is having his own data so why not combine that data and come out with some analysis so that is something which is going to happen through this uh, new analytic tools available so sanjeev. i think this yes sanjeev ji yes we have met before also in our sanjeev put your video on okay okay no problem My video is on, sir. Yes, yes. I am Mr. What I have to say? Yeah. yeah. Okay. In that respect, to what point you have been saying, what I understand is concurrent audit or continuous audit should be stressed. That is what we need to say, so, so that banks don't uh, get into those problems which they have faced. And so many nationalized banks have reduced from twenty-eight to the number. Yeah. So concurrent audit actually has not really helped. Because yes. their scope Because is very the very limited. These are not proper. No, this yeah, is no, a very yeah. important point. Concurrent audit has not uh, helped. Yeah, Mr. Sanjeev Pandey, go ahead. Very good point yeah, yeah. on the quality of concurrent audit. So concurrent audit are basically looking at the mostly the bank transactions, and now I think uh, some uh, panelists have spoken that now these transactions are in invisible. So these, I think, Mr. Narendra said that these transactions happen in a clearing house, not in the branch. So whatever checks are cleared in the account. they are already cleared i don't know sitting in a branch whether this check is drawn in its own family members favor or some interested party or in a is a genuine trade transaction so those kind of things are happening so i think uh, what i am talking about is a much bigger scale audit where this this will be a bigger firm given a more better fees and they will be putting more resources on a particular corporate and i think they will deploy this on some larger corporate where the exposure is say finder crore or more so that the cost of audit can also be done and then they should come out with a audit report every time they are monitoring just like a uh, market analyst they are monitoring the company they have access to the banks transactions they have access to so much other data and when they come out with a report which will have a 360 degree view of this okay what is the now demand of product whether it's going up or down whether uh, the the payment uh, of the a great uh, borrower other than bank because what is happening today is that many of these uh, borrowers are taken to nclt by other creditors they are uh, standard account with the bank but some operational creditor is taking dragging him to nclt and they end up into resolution or liquidation so this auditor will keep a track of everything like they'll keep a track of any defaults made by this creditor in the market they'll keep a track of any sl transaction whether any insolvency is filed so there are so many variables now only a transaction auditor or a statutory auditor may not be able to cover in a limited time right. so that is what i am mean coming from so they should have a full time team monitoring this company and they should look at from various angles so that every three months they come back with a report to the bank or to the consortium that this is what is happening so that is how you can they will highlight the risk and we can take some preemptive action excellent insights the quantum uh, jump in terms of uh, quality uh, depth scope and requirements uh, of audit india leads the growth story worldwide new benchmarks coming uh, lots of interactive session consultation paper of nfra 
SEBI, RBI, I hope they'll get much more, much, much higher response. And the, also the council members will get new learnings and articulate appropriately, cordially, work together for the India Growth Story. Excellent response coming. So many experts, participants, uh, so many speakers. Excellent comments. Uh, any any thoughts? Uh, excellent comments. Uh, uh, chat uh, box. Uh, Abhishek, uh, Suresh. Would anybody like to comment? Put on their videos and acknowledge the great work by all the experts, participants. Interactive, excellent deliberation. Before we finally close off for the it's every happy Navratri for all. Happiest Navratri. Happy Navratri. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Happy Navratri. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank, you. thank, thank you. you very much, the eminent speakers uh, and experts. It was uh, really so uh, with the Navratri, Naya Tarika, Naya. Methodology, Naya learning, sub karne ka hai. Wohi pehle ka hi mindset bak, bak, pakad ke baitna nahi. So, <laughs> yeah, abhi right. aisa, uske liye Manoj jaisa think tank ye sab hai na, bhot jaruri hai. All yeah. the best. Abhishek, put your videos on. Wonderful to have you here. Abhishek, your Navratri, uh, wish to all. Narendra ji, what yeah. I've said, I, 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 I want to thank each and every speaker, yeah. and speakers, chartered accountants, and um, ICWA uh, holders, and uh, CFAs. It was a very uh, learning, uh, wonderful experience from learning perspective. And uh, I got to know a lot about the auditing from auditing perspective. What are the new auditing standards which are going to come up? And uh, I, I would like to thank Mr. Uh, Ganatra uh, for the uh, wonderful presentation. And... Uh, would like to uh, would like to uh, in case if he is uh, comfortable sharing the PPT so that we can uh, you we know, even discuss PPT. about yeah we'll discuss offline huh? sure, sure, sure. Please, sure. I, I sent to I sent to Manoj ji Abhishek please circulate the YouTube please. channel let see like a CA see it also through your effort interactive yes. discussions are more important PPTs are plagiarized and copied and more discussions are important you know you participated in discussions and enjoyed it right right, right. thank you Dr. thank Ganesh. you very much and all the speakers, uh, uh, Abhishek, put your video on and thank all the participants. You are very good at giving what thanks. And it is a special Navratri event today. <laughs> okay, yeah. So uh, uh, I would uh, like to start with uh, uh, Mr. Manoj, uh, uh, who has given a great insight. And especially the speaker who has started this, uh, uh, this meeting on a good note, Mr. Rajendra M. Ganatra. I think you are the most, uh, you know, knowledgeable person from uh, in in the among all the uh, speakers, and uh, we have learned a lot, sir, and would like to hear again uh, whenever the opportunity comes up. Uh, Mr. Narendra M. Coast, uh, uh, you have uh, from banking perspective, you have shared uh, the valuable insights, and uh, I'm really thankful from all the audience and uh, 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 participants. Mr. Sanjeev Vora, uh, and uh, I, I haven't uh, no, don't know the uh, uh, speakers and the panelists uh, much inside, but because this first time I'm attending this uh, webinar, uh, Ms. Archana Moge has also spoken uh, from uh, audit uh, perspective. Uh, it was uh, great hearing and learning from her. And uh, in case if I have missed out on anyone, I really, uh, I'm really sorry. Mr. Because Kannan, I'm just a Mr. participant. Mr. Kannan has been part of SOCAM and uh, top of banker and head of Hitwija Group in performing, monitoring performance of all the companies and participating in board meetings, including Sensex companies. Okay, okay. Uh, we don't you. have the uh, list of the uh, 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 award uh, winner. Archana is the award winner for members in, in business and industry of ICI and a member of various uh, uh, committees in the past. Hopefully, she'll be taken again in the future also. So, sure. wonderful insight. And uh, final, uh, very good word of thanks, uh, Abhishek. Keep coming and spreading the word on live interaction, think tank. You are part of the think tank. It's all interactive open houses. The only place which is uh, open house, all the institutes of uh, professionals appreciate it. 
uh, and also to your efforts convey to all the participants uh, institute they should have open houses and give people to participate no close houses by them right. they have been doing so far thank you everybody wonderful wonderful insight we end the meeting here happy navratri to all happy navratri thank you thanks thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. bye bye